Chapter 1. Kirsten. I can't believe it's finally done, I say with a sigh to my best friend Molly as I look around the quaint space. It's been a long few weeks, but finally my coffee shop is open. I've dreamed of opening one for as long as I can remember. It's perfect, Molly says as she inserts a clip in her short blonde hair to keep it out of her face. Then she dons an apron and shoots me a thumbs-up sign. I flip the closed sign to open and unlock the door. There isn't a long line out the door, but there are a few customers, and I believe in my bones there will be more. The old, if you build it, they will come belief. After all, even small-town USA needs a good coffee shop. We haven't had anything except the drudge the family restaurant down the street passes off as coffee for as long as I can remember. Welcome to Perk Up. I greet the customers with a smile and a little card that gives them a free cup of coffee. Molly and I both figured people would be more likely to try something new if we let them have a free taste. And we are both confident that once tasted, our coffee will sell itself. The customers smile at me and take a card before filing in line to order with Molly. She's proficient, and soon the patrons are sitting at tables around the room. Grins and laughter abound as they sip their coffees, and Molly and I exchange a knowing look. Success! Then, suddenly, a loud pounding sound fills the air. Smiles shift to grimaces and flinches, and I see money flying out the door. Don't worry, folks, I say as I head for the door. I'll go see what the racket is and get them to stop. I step out of the door and turn left. The building next to us had been for sale at the same time the one I bought was, I had hoped to purchase both of them, but just hadn't had the money. It appeared now that someone else had bought the building and they weren't a quiet neighbor. The noise inside the building grows even larger as I pull open the door. A man clad in a pair of loose-fitting blue jeans and a tank top stands near a counter, a sledgehammer in his hand. Another stands off to the side, but he appears to be scraping the walls. Probably not the source of the noise, so I don't pay him much attention. Music blares from an old boombox that sits on a table in the middle of the room. Hello? I holler, but neither man appears to hear me, and Thor swings the sledgehammer again, sending another loud bang and pieces of wood flying into the air. Irritation flooding my veins, I march over to the boombox and flick the switch to turn the music off. His head turns my direction, and my breath catches at the fierce look in his eyes. Who are you, and what are you doing? His voice is deep and velvety and contains the smallest trace of anger. I place my hands on my hips and thrust my chin out. He intimidates me, but I'm not about to let him see that. I'm Kirsten Johnson, and I own the coffee shop next door. We just opened this morning, and your demolition is disturbing my customers. He sets the sledgehammer down and saunters my direction, slowly and full of swagger. Confidence oozes off him with every step, and I force myself not to take a step back. He stops inches from me. I can feel the heat radiating off of him and smell the scent of sweat mixing with his soap. A woodsy scent that reminds me of camping in the woods. His stormy gray eyes rake over me before returning to my gaze. I'm not sure how that's my problem. I force a tight smile on my lips and gather my courage. Please let my voice sound steady. It's your problem because we are neighbors and the walls are thin. Surely you can work on something else until we close and then return to the destruction of your building? His eyes narrow and lightning flashes in their depths. You want me to stop my demolition? 
which will delay my construction and my opening until you are closed each day? Okay, when he says it like that, it does sound demanding. Well, maybe not stop completely, but quiet down some. The loud bangs are scaring my patrons. It's a coffee shop. They can take it to go. He leans down next to me and flicks the radio back on before walking back to a sledgehammer. My mouth drops open in anger, frustration, confusion. I don't usually have a problem convincing people to be civil. But then again, most people are civil to begin with. This man obviously has no manners. I glare at his back before clicking the music off again. Then I march out of his building before he can say another word. Tristan. I glance up as the music stops. If Dylan is trying to mess with my stations again, I might have to clock him. I can't stand his country music, and he can't stand my rock. But I won the toss-up today. However, it's not Dylan who has turned the music off, but a curvy brunette with fire for eyes. Who are you and what are you doing? She places her hands on her hips and tilts her chin up, probably to make her appear taller than her five-foot frame. I'm Kirsten Johnson, and I own the coffee shop next door. We just opened this morning, and your demolition is disturbing my customers. I set down the sledgehammer as I step in her direction. Nearly a foot taller than her, I tower over her, and I see her stiffen so as not to step back. She's a firecracker, I'll give her that much, but I can read the hesitation in her eyes. I'm not sure how that's my problem. Her lips pull into a smug, condescending smile. It's your problem because we are neighbors and the walls are thin. Surely you can work on something else until we close and then return to your destruction of your building? Wow, she has some nerve. You want me to stop my demolition, which will delay my construction and my opening until you are closed each day? Her lips part as if she's about to speak, and then her bottom lip folds under her teeth. The shifting of her eyes tell me she realizes how snotty she sounded. Well, maybe not stop completely, but quiet down some? The loud bangs are scaring my patrons. It's a coffee shop. They can take it to go. I lean close to her, close enough to catch the sweet scent of vanilla radiating off her, and flick the radio back on. Her mouth drops open, and I resist the urge to close it for her. Dylan has been watching the whole exchange with a silent smirk, and I flash him a wink as I return to the sledgehammer and pick it back up. I know she will turn the music off again, and when she does, I glance up to see a defiant smile on her face, as if she thinks she's won, but she has no idea who she's dealing with. I can play these games all day. Her heels click as she marches across the cement floor, and I admire the view as she leaves. Her dark hair curls around her shoulders, and her hips sway as she leaves, though I doubt she knows she swings them. When the door closes, I cross to the radio, turn it back on, and then turn the volume up for good measure. Really? Dylan shouts over the music. You have to turn it up? I shrug. I'm not a jerk. Not really. But I'm also not the type of guy to let a pretty woman walk all over me simply because she's pretty. I've done that enough in my life, and I'm done. With a smile, I return to demolishing the old counter, knowing she is probably fuming next door. I can almost picture the smoke coming out of her ears with each pound of the hammer. Sadly, the counter is the last thing that needs to be taken down. Had she just waited half an hour, the noise would probably have stopped. Now I'll have to find new ways to annoy her. There's no way I'm giving her the satisfaction of thinking she won just because I was almost done. 
Chapter 2. Kirsten. My anger flares as I approach the building the next morning. A giant dumpster sits outside his building, but it's so large that it blocks part of my shop as well. I can't imagine he needed anything this large, but he was probably trying to make a point. I'm still shaking my head as I step in the door. That man is hot, Molly supplies with a wiggle of her eyebrows. What? No, he's obnoxious. Yesterday, he deliberately turned his music up after I tried talking to him. Molly's brow shoots up. Did you really try talking to him, or did you just demand he quiet down? Drat, she knows me too well. I shake my head, frustrated at myself and her ability to read me like a book, as I lean against the counter. Okay, the latter, but still, if he had any manners, he would have done it. Now he's parked this dumpster monstrosity outside that will probably scare our customers away all day. The customers understood yesterday, and I'm sure they will today as well. Are you sure this agitation isn't something else? What are you talking about? I mean, it's been a while since you've been out with a man, and if he is the same one I saw hauling out trash this morning then he is definitely a fine specimen of a man. I mean, I only saw the back of him, but it was N-I-C-E, she says, spelling out the word. Do you think maybe your agitation is really attraction? Not on your life, I say, rolling my eyes. But I turn to look out the window so she can't see the heat I feel crawling up my face. He had consumed my thoughts last night and appeared in my dreams, and I don't even know his name. I was sure it was due to my anger over his insensitivity, but now that Molly has pointed it out, my brain reminds me of how much time I spent thinking about his lips last night. His perfect, full lips that looked as if they knew how to kiss a woman in just the right way to send her pulse soaring. And his arms, the strong, chiseled muscles that would be hard to the touch, but offer a shield of protection and warmth to the right woman. Egad, I need to get my emotions under control. Yes, it has been some time since my last date but that does not mean that I am going to throw myself at the first handsome man I see, especially not him. Okay, if you say so, Molly says, but it's five minutes past opening time and you're still staring out the window. I shake my head, clearing the daydreams, and unlock the door. It's only day two, and if I want this place to be a success... I better focus on it and not the man next door. Tristan Rented the largest one you could find, didn't you? Dylan asks as he picks up a large piece of wood. I don't know what you mean, I say, grabbing an equally large slab. No way am I letting him show me up. Of course you don't. You just rented the dumpster that could house the Titanic when what we have in here probably wouldn't fill the one in the alley. You just couldn't help getting under her skin, could you? She deserved it. I push open the door with my back and lead the way to the dumpster. As we pass in front of her shop, my eyes glance inside and see her smiling and chatting with customers. So she does smile, and it's beautiful. Why don't you just ask the girl out? Dylan's question breaks the trance her smile has me under, and I turn and heave the heavy wood into the dumpster. I have no time to date, and certainly not a pushy woman like her who would drive me crazy. Right. Disbelief laces his voice. We'll see how long that lasts. I shoot him a glare, but a part of me knows he's right. Strong-willed women have always been my kryptonite, and having to see this one every day will eventually wear down my resolve. 
Chapter 3 Kirsten By closing time that evening, I can't take the noise anymore. My head pounds, and all I want to do is go home and relax in a bubble bath with no noise. Normally, I would light candles and have soft music playing, but all I've heard all day is the neighbor's music and the thuds of them throwing things in the dumpster. I just want silence. After locking the door, I head out back to my car and climb in. I insert the key and turn it, but nothing happens. I try again, but there is no engine roaring to life. There is nothing but a click. Great. My battery is dead. You need a jump? I look up to see the man from next door. His tank top is molded to his chest, showing off his washboard abs and strong arms. His shoulders have this amazing arc to them that makes me want to run my hands across them. I do need a jump but do I let him help me? As if sensing my hesitation, he holds out his hand. I think we got off on the wrong foot. I'm Tristan Dixon. The wrong foot? I think you've been deliberately trying to annoy me. A smirk pulls at the corner of his lips, and he shrugs. Guilty, but you did start it. I'm about to argue with him, but he is right. I could have been nicer when I asked him to hold down the noise yesterday. I step out of the car and hold out my hand. Okay, you might be correct, so I agree to a new start. I'm Kirsten. As he shakes my hand, I feel electricity shoot up my arm. Oh no, was Molly right? Was my agitation really attraction? All right, Kirsten. Let's see if we can get your car started. He walks to a large blue Chevy truck and opens the driver's door, returning with a portable starter. I should definitely get myself one of those. He folds himself into my driver's seat and plugs it in. A hum fills the air as it turns on. It's going to take a few minutes, he says, as he steps out of the car and leans against it. His air is carefree as he folds his arms and regards me. Oh, well, um, okay, why don't you tell me a little about yourself? Why am I stuttering over every word around this man now? It's like his smile has lowered my IQ all of a sudden. His left eyebrow inches up his forehead and the corners of his lips dance. What do you want to know? I resist the urge to say everything, even though I do want to know everything. Um, where did you move from? I grew up in this town, and I certainly hadn't seen him around before yesterday. Dylan and I just moved from California. We were tired of the busy city life and looking for a place a little quieter. Oh, are you too... I don't even want to ask. It seems rude, and really, it's none of my business, though I'm dying to know. Brothers? He supplies with a laugh. Yeah, we are. Heat crawls up my face, and I look down at the ground. Brothers? Of course. Had I paid much attention to the other guy, I probably would have seen some facial features in common. But Tristan has consumed my focus since yesterday. Do you have siblings? He's offering the question as a lifeline, a way to keep me from being too embarrassed. I do, a brother and a sister. He's the doctor in town and she's the librarian. A doctor, a librarian, and a barista. Entrepreneur, I interject. I'm not just a barista. I own the coffee shop. He holds up his hands in apology. My mistake, entrepreneur. I was going to say that was an eclectic group of careers your family has. Is there something wrong with that? I can't tell if he's making fun of me and my defenses are rising again. Relax, firecracker. It was an observation, not a put-down. 
Firecracker? I don't know why, but I kind of like the nickname. I like it even more that he's given it to me. What about you? I ask. What are you and your brother opening? Ah, that's a secret. Can't spill that too soon or we'll have everyone banging down the door to get in. He flashes a wink, so I know he's kidding. Mostly. But I am still curious as to why he won't tell me. The machine inside the car dings, which I assume means it's done. My guess is confirmed when Tristan ducks back inside the car and turns the key. The engine fires up, and he removes the device. All set, he says, and begins to walk back to his truck, but suddenly I don't want him to go. Thank you. Can I take you to dinner to repay you? The words are out before I can stop them, but I find I don't want to reel them back anyway. He turns, tilting his head at me. I've already eaten, but if you like dessert... I do, and I know a great place. Actually, I rarely eat dessert. I can't even stand the taste of chocolate, though I get teased for hating it all the time but I am willing to suffer through something sweet to spend more time with him. All right, let me just put this charger back and text Dylan that I'll be late. Tristan. I bite back my smile as I walk to my truck. Something clearly made Kirsten have a change of heart, and I don't think it was just my offer to jump her car. Maybe, like me, She had someone yammering in her ear all day about how everyone deserves a second chance. I love my brother, but sometimes when he gets on my case like this, I wish we hadn't decided to open this restaurant together. However, I suppose I'll have to thank him this time. I drop the charger on the seat and shoot Dylan a quick text to let him know I'll be late. I don't want him sending the police out looking for me. He's always been a worrier, but since we lost mom and dad to an auto accident last year, he's become a little obsessive about it. If I'm running late and forget to contact him, he begins to fear the worst, and I certainly don't need him going manic on me. I keep hoping time will ease his fears, but so far it hasn't, which is another reason we moved out here. Small towns have less crime and fewer accidents, so I'm hoping the combination will allow him to relax a little more. Where are you going? He responds back. To grab dessert with Kirsten. I'm making nice. I shove the phone in my pocket to have a reason not to respond right away if he pings back, and then I walk back to Kirsten. Shall we take one car or two? Um, a soft pink flares on her cheeks. She's even cuter when she's embarrassed. I guess we can take one. Shall we take mine to let the battery run some? Her car is small and a little uncomfortable for my long frame, but she does make sense. So I nod and scrunch down in her passenger seat. Even with the seat all the way back, my knees almost touch the dashboard. So where is this amazing place? I ask and place my hands on my thighs. They aren't comfortable there either, but I'm not sure where else to put them. Just down the street. I suppose we could have walked, actually, she says, as she backs the car up. It's such a small town that nearly everything you need is here on the main drag. The main drag. I smirk a little at that. A quarter of a million people live where I grew up, so the main drag was nearly every street. And somehow I doubt this main drag has everything I'll need. So far, I've seen a post office, a grocery store, a clothing store, a family restaurant, her coffee shop, and my place. That hardly qualifies as everything I'll need. But I decide not to insult her town. I'm sure it will grow on me. Here we are, she says as she pulls into a parking space in front of a small cupcake shop. Sandwiched between the clothing store and the post office, 
It's so small I hadn't even noticed it the last few days I've driven by. A cupcake stenciled and the words Miss Moffat's Cupcakes on the glass door are the only signs that this shop isn't part of the store on either side of it. Does this place even have seating? I don't mean for the words to sound snarky, but I can't imagine more than one or two tables fitting in this place. Her head snaps in my direction, and I see the spark in her eyes again. But instead of lashing out at me, she laughs. It's a high-pitched laugh that reminds me somehow of Belle's. Yes, it has seating. Not much, but enough. Now, come on. I follow her lead and climb out of the car. When she opens the door, my jaw literally drops. Like some kind of special effect, the interior of the place is much larger than it appears from the outside. Not huge, mind you, but big enough for several tables, a counter, and a small couch. Well, hey, Kirsten, I haven't seen you in here in ages. The woman behind the counter appears about Kirsten's age, with long dark hair pulled back in a ponytail, and a pretty face that sports a little too much makeup for my taste. Her voice is soft and southern, but holds just the trace of condescension. Hey, Tess. Yeah, it's been busy. Molly and I just opened Perk Up the other day, and we've had a steady stream of customers keeping our hands full. I glance at Kirsten out of the corner of my eye. There have been customers, but not what I'd call a steady stream. And I wonder what the beef is between these two. Her smile is about as real as fool's gold, and there's a sticky sweetness in her voice that doesn't usually reside there. The tension is definitely palpable. Well, isn't that sweet? Who's your friend? Suddenly, her eyes are on me, and the way they travel up my body makes me wish I had long sleeves on. This is Tristan. He and his brother just moved here and are renovating the space next to mine. Kirsten's voice has taken on a stiff edge, and she steps closer to me as if telling Tess to back off. Tess's eyes flick between us as if she's trying to decide if we're together. I barely know Kirsten, but I already don't like Tess. So I put my arm around Kirsten and pull her to me. Yep, Kirsten and I had a great day and thought we'd celebrate our first date with a little dessert. Tess's lips pull into a tight line and her southern charm slips for just a second, before a wide beauty pageant smile covers her face. Well, any friend of Kirsten's is a friend of mine, What's your fancy for tonight? I glance at Kirsten, ready to allow her to choose, but she motions me forward. You're the one who's new here. You decide, she says. I drop my arm from her shoulder, surprised to find I miss the sensation, and then step forward. Dozens of tiny cupcakes fill the glass counter, but they all look as pretentious as Tess seems. I don't even like desserts, but I hadn't wanted Kirsten to think I was turning her invitation down just because I'd already had dinner. Now I'm wishing I'd suggested a walk or something instead, though. I point to the least decorated cupcake and Tess takes it out. Will this be for here? She asks and lifts her eyebrow at me. Actually, I think we'll take it to go, I say, and reach for my wallet. The thought of sitting in this place with Tessa's eyes on me holds no appeal. The first one's on the house, she says, in a voice oozing with honey, and then she grabs a card and tucks it in the side of the box. I'll just leave you my card so you can call me when you need a new fix. She glances at Kirsten as she says the words, and I don't miss her double meaning but I have no intention of calling her, ever. I've known too many women like her in California. Why did you take me here? I ask Kirsten, when the door has closed behind us and Tess is out of earshot. I'm sorry, I didn't know she'd be working. 
Her mother owns the shop, and she's lovely. I haven't seen Tess in ages. Last I heard, she had moved away and married some rich doctor. Her shoulders have a defeated air as she steps toward the car, but I reach out and grab her hand. There's no sense in going back yet, just because the service was poor. Surely there's a place around here we could eat this in peace. A flicker of hope blooms in her eyes. Yeah? Yeah, I say. I don't even really like desserts. I just didn't want you to think I wasn't interested in going out with you. She throws back her head and laughs. Hard. So hard that a tear trickles out of the corner of her eye. Though unexpected, it forces a smile to my face as well. What? I don't like desserts either, she says, wiping away the wetness. I only agreed because I didn't want you to leave. A wide smile crosses my face and I squeeze her hand. Well, it seems, Firecracker, that we have more in common than we thought. Her laugh quiets and she turns big eyes at me. The kind of eyes that suck you in, that steal your soul, that quiet your fears. I can see that she wants me to kiss her, and I am only too happy to oblige. I place the cupcake box on the hood of her car, and then place that hand on her cheek. She leans into it, just slightly, but I can feel it. Her cheek is as soft as I expected, like the petal of a rose. Her breath catches as I lean closer, and I can sense her body reaching out to mine, begging me to touch her lips. I stop, just inches from her parted lips. Her closed eyes flutter, and the vein in her neck pulses. My heart speeds up to match her rhythm, and when I finally touch her lips, sparks fly between us. I called her Firecracker because of her feisty personality, but I swear I can hear explosions as the kiss deepens. I haven't felt sensations like this in years, and I realize I am in trouble. This girl could steal my heart without even trying. The question is, what would she do with it? Chapter 4. Kirsten I am still smiling as I enter the coffee shop the next morning. Oh my gosh, you kissed him! Molly's voice is both accusing and congratulatory. What? How do you always know? Molly has always had this uncanny ability to read me, and while I sometimes find it annoying, today it just makes me smile. I'm pretty sure nothing could ruin my mood today. It's written all over your face, she says with a laugh. Your face is all swoony, and that smile is practically painted on. I roll my eyes at her description of me, but it probably isn't far off base. Okay, I say excitedly, as I cross to the counter. We kissed, and it was amazing. When I left here yesterday, my car wouldn't start, so he gave me a jump, and then I asked him to dinner. Wait, she holds up a hand as she shakes her head. You did what? Well, you told me to try and be nicer to him. I thought a dinner invite was a nice thing to do. Uh-huh. Okay. Then what? She begins pulling out the prep items for the coffee, but I know she is still listening. He said he'd already eaten, so we decided to grab dessert. But you hate sweets, she says whirling to face me again. I know, and it turns out he does too, but I didn't know that. We went to Miss Moffat's, only Tess is back in town. Did you know that? She shrugs and checks the small fridge where we keep the milk and cream. Yeah, I saw her about a week ago. Figured you didn't need the distraction, what with the opening and all. That is true. Tess and I haven't been friends since high school when she spread rumors about me to turn my boyfriend against me, and relief doesn't even begin to describe how I've felt since she's been gone. 
knowing she was back while trying to finish the last-minute touches on my coffee shop would have probably messed with my head. Just another reason I adore Molly. Anyway, she came on to Tristan hard, but he wanted none of it. We decided to take a walk, but then he ended up kissing me right in front of the cupcake shop. Molly's head pops up again. How did you go from going for a walk to kissing? Uh, I close my eyes as I think back to the previous night, but the only details standing out are the feel of his lips against mine, the heat of his body mingling with mine, and the overwhelming desire to see him again. I don't really know. We were laughing, and then he called me firecracker and said we had a lot in common, and then we were kissing. Molly shakes her head as she closes the fridge door. Well, however you got there, I'm glad to see you smiling again. I'm glad to be smiling again. After my last boyfriend, Todd, decided he would rather date his 20-year-old yoga instructor than me, I definitely went through a dry spell. Maybe that's why my body still tingles even though I haven't seen Tristan for eight hours. Me too. I wonder what kind of coffee he drinks. Need an excuse to see him again? She asks with a smirk. No, but I'm sure he might like coffee. He and his brother, who I'm pretty sure is single as well, I say, wiggling my eyebrows at her this time. Molly laughs but shakes her head. Nope, I'm not looking to date right now. But as for your coffees, you should probably just take Americanos and maybe some cream. Most of the men who come in here don't order the specialty drinks. Well, they're from California, so they might be different, but I'll trust your judgment. Her face clouds a moment, taking on a wistful expression. They're from California? Yeah, why? Molly didn't grow up here. She moved into town a few years ago, and we hit it off instantly. So good, in fact, that I often forget we haven't known each other forever. Oh, no reason. There is more to this story, and I'm curious as to what, but seeing Tristan again consumes my focus, so I step behind the counter and make two Americanos. Then I place them in a carrier with some cream and head for the building next door. On my way out, I flip the sign and flash another smile at Molly. Tristan. I'm still reeling from my evening the night before when Kirsten walks through the door. Her dark hair falls to her shoulders in a soft curl, and though I want to tangle my fingers in it, I resist. Hey, she says, holding out the travel tray of coffee. I thought you and your brother could use some coffee. She glances around the room. Where is your brother? Not here yet. I had tasked him with making sure Stacy leaves town. Stacy, my ex-girlfriend, had shown up at my door the previous night after I left Kirsten. Though I'd managed to keep her at arm's length then, my heart was still reeling from her visit, and I hadn't been sure I would have the strength to make her leave if and when she showed up this morning. Oh, okay. Well, I hope you guys like Americanos. Molly says they're a hit with most of our male customers. She saunters across the floor and holds the tray out to me. Her tongue rolls across her bottom lip before her teeth bite down on it, and I can see that she wants me to kiss her. And I want to, but I have to make sure Stacy is gone first. Yeah, we like coffee. Thanks for thinking of us. Her face falls slightly at my words, and I can see the questions in her eyes. I should just tell her about Stacy, but we're too new. I don't want to cloud a new relationship with dirt from the past. Um, you're welcome. I guess I'll see you around then. She turns as I take the tray, and the dejection is heavy on her shoulders. I have to tell her. I can't let her go thinking all day that I don't want to see her. 
Kirsten, wait. She turns, but before I can finish my thought, the door opens again and Stacy enters with Dylan close behind. His pinched face declares his apology, but I can't blame him too much. Stacy can be very persuasive and demanding when she wants to be. So this is where you're hiding out, Tristan? I can't believe you would leave your brother to take care of me this morning. I watch Kirsten tense at the words. It's not what she thinks, but I can see the hurt on her face. She thinks I was with Stacy last night, even though that's not what happened. Who are you? Stacy asks, turning her attention to Kirsten for the first time. Obviously, no one, Kirsten says, as she hurries out of the building. I let out an exasperated breath, hoping I'll be able to fix it with her later. Stacy, I told you last night that we are through, or did you forget that you left me for your dentist? She smiles up at me, a pout on her lips. Her manicured hand touches my chest and I resist the urge to bat it away. I was wrong, Tristan. I thought I wanted the security his money could bring, but we didn't have a connection, not like you and I have. Now I do remove her hand. You should have thought of that before you left. I'm done with you, Stacy. Dylan and I are happy here, and I'm not returning to California. But, but, her face folds in confusion. You can't stay here. She waves her red claws around. There's nothing here. Actually, there is. There's this building, good coffee, and a woman next door I'd like to get to know better. Her expression changes to a shocked outrage. You mean the barista next door? Entrepreneur, I say, and take a sip of the coffee. And her name is Kirsten. Now, how about I drive you to the bus station so you can book a ticket home? Her mouth falls open and then pulls into a snarl. I'll find my own way to the airport. You may think you're happy now, but you'll be sorry when you realize this town is boring and that cow over there will never compare to me. My jaw clenches and I squeeze the coffee cup so hard that the lid pops off. Hot coffee spills down over my hand and drips onto the floor. I'm sorry, Dylan says, as Stacy whirls past him and out the door. I tried to steer her away, but she's a handful. Yes, she is, I say with a half laugh as I look around for a towel. And it's okay, I understand. Spying no towel, I set the cup down and use the bottom of my shirt to dry my hand. I just have to figure out how to convince Kirsten that nothing happened now. Chapter 5. Kirsten. I paste a forced smile on my face as I hand over the drink to the customer. Here you go. Thanks for stopping and perk up. You better find a way to make that a real smile before you scare all the customers away, Molly says in a low hiss, before flashing another smile at the customers. I can't help it. I'm so stupid. I didn't even ask if he had a girlfriend. But I should have known he would have. And you should have seen her. She looked like a movie star. One who specializes in yoga. I stare pointedly at Molly so she'll get my hint. First Todd, and now Tristan? Did you even give him a chance to explain? Molly asks, as she cleans the coffee grinder in the sink. Or did you just assume the worst, like you normally do? She said he left his brother to take care of her this morning. She obviously spent the night. What else could that mean? He must have hooked up with her after our kiss. I was probably his form of foreplay or something. I collapse down onto the stool we keep behind the counter and drop my head in my hands. Okay, that does sound bad, but it could mean a lot of things, Molly says, wiping her hands on the towel. 
I think before you go convicting the guy, you should at least ask him. What's the point? He obviously likes tiny women with perfect figures, just like Todd. Hey, you are beautiful just the way you are, and if he can't see that, then he isn't the right man for you anyway. But I still think you should at least hear him out. Deep down, I know she's probably right, but I've been hurt too many times. I just can't take the rejection again. And it was only one kiss. If I push it from my mind, surely I can forget about him. Except that he works next door, and I'll probably see him every day. Ugh, why did I have to give him a second chance? I would have been better off had I just continued hating him and assuming he was an obnoxious jerk. Tristan I have no idea if this will work, as I don't know what Kirsten likes to eat. But my mother always said my pasta was amazing, and it's the only thing I have. I wait until I see their last customer leave, and then I send Dylan over. He's a good sport and has agreed to act as server for this dinner tonight. I just hope she lets him in. Dressed in black slacks and a white shirt, I watch him walk to her door. Then I duck inside our building as he knocks on her door. I hear his voice carry the few feet from her doorway. Good evening, mademoiselle. May I come in? Uh, sure. I give them another minute, plenty of time for him to get her seated, though my pulse is racing and my feet want to bolt her direction. When the minute is up, I pull back my shoulders and walk to her door. As I open the door, her head pops up, and her confusion turns to anger. She pushes back from the table as if she's going to leave, but I hurry to her side. Wait, I say, placing the covered dish in the middle of the table. Please, just let me explain. I let my eyes plead with her, wanting to take her hands, but not wanting to extend her discomfort. Fine, explain. Her voice is cold, short, but she points to the chair across from her, and I sit. I'm sorry about Stacy, I say. Sorry she outed you, you mean? Kirsten's hands are folded in her lap, her posture stiff and straight. What? No, she and I broke up ages ago. She left me for her dentist. I had no idea she even knew where I'd gone until I got home last night and she was on my doorstep. Right, which is why you let her spend the night. I shake my head. I didn't let her spend the night. I told her to leave town, but I figured she wouldn't. She doesn't like hearing no. I left early this morning to avoid her and asked Dylan to make sure she left, but she convinced him she wanted to apologize to me before leaving. I should have told you about her. I would have, but we just met and had that amazing kiss. I didn't think bringing up an ex was the best way to start a new relationship. I look at her with hopeful eyes. I haven't felt a connection with anyone the way I have with Kirsten, and I don't want to lose it. She holds my gaze and then sighs. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have jumped to conclusions. It's just my ex broke up with me for some young blonde thing, and when I saw her, I felt like it was happening all over again. I reach across the table and grab her hand. Your ex was stupid. You are beautiful, and I'm sorry I made you feel otherwise. You think I'm beautiful? Her words are hesitant, and I hate that anyone has made her feel less than desirable in her past. I don't cook for just any woman, I say, and smile down at the dish. You cooked for me? I lift the cover to reveal the pasta and flash her a crooked grin. I did. Made the pasta from scratch, too slaved away in the kitchen all day, and didn't get any work done on the restaurant, which is what we are opening, but your forgiveness will make it worth it. The light returns to her eyes, and the corners of her lips twitch as if holding back a smile. A restaurant, huh? Well, I suppose I should taste the food before I grant forgiveness. She picks up the fork and spears a plump pasta before placing it in her mouth. My eyes are fixed on her as she chews. 
I've never wanted someone to like my food so badly. This is delicious, she says when the bite is swallowed. So I'm forgiven? I suppose. I don't wait for her to say anything more before I take her in my arms and taste her lips again. Vaguely, I register Dylan clapping and then the sound of the front door opening. Sorry, forgot my... Dylan? I break the kiss to see a blonde woman staring at my brother. You know each other? Kirsten asks as she looks from the blonde to Dylan. Yeah, this is the guy who broke my heart. The end. If you enjoyed this short story, please leave a review. Just a few words helps. Want to find out Molly and Dylan's story? Be sure to check out Small Town Second Chances coming soon. And follow the whole series to see Kirsten and Tristan's epilogue. Chapter 1. Molly. It's been a long day trying to cheer Kirsten up, and I am craving a caramel chocolate cupcake. But as I pull into Miss Moffat's and reach for my wallet, I realize it is not on the car seat next to me. For just a second, I freak out, but then I remember that I left my wallet next to my apron at work. With a sigh, I turn the car back around. My cupcake will have to wait. As I pull into a space in front of Perk Up, I notice the lights are still on. Why is Kirsten still here? I figured she would be at home, either feeling sorry for herself or plotting ways to get back at Tristan. Poor guy. I sure hope he has tough skin because Kirsten not only holds grudges for days, but when she feels maligned, well, you better be watching your back. I love the girl, but I've been in her warpath once or twice, and it's not a fun place to live. It's not even a fun place to visit. And while most of the time her anger is justified, occasionally, like today, she jumps to a conclusion before she hears the whole story. I guess I can't really blame her after Todd dumped her for his much younger yoga instructor, but we all have those stories in our past. Heck, my last boyfriend left without a word. I turned down a job for him, and then he just up and disappeared. After exiting and locking the car, I cover the short distance to the front door and swing it open. Sorry, forgot my... I'm completely expecting to see Kirsten. I am not expecting to see the other two men. One is currently locking lips with Kirsten, and from his build and the fact that he is kissing Kirsten, I assume him to be Tristan. The other appears to be a man from my past, a man I never thought I would see again. His black pants and white shirt are a far cry from the attire I remember him wearing, but in my heart I know it is him. It is hard to forget the man you thought you were going to marry. Dylan? Tristan and Kirsten break apart. You know each other? She asks as she looks from me to Dylan. Yeah, this is the guy who broke my heart. What are the odds? When Kirsten told me Tristan and his brother had moved from California, I had thought of Dylan, but I could never have imagined that it would be him. After all, thousands of people lived in California, unlike our small town here in Texas. I had laughed the first time I saw the population sign, and it was under 1,000. A thousand people had lived in a city block where I came from in California. I hardly think that's fair, Dylan says, stepping toward me. I whirl to face him and cross my arms. You don't think it's fair? I gave up a dream job to be with you, and then you left without a word which is what I think you should do now. A gasp escapes Kirsten's lips. Molly? No? Well, then I'll leave. I stalk over to the cabinet and snatch up my wallet. Forget the caramel chocolate cupcake. I need a pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream, a giant spoon, and a steady stream of romantic comedies. Dylan. What is she talking about, Dylan? Tristan asks as Molly storms out the door and he turns to face me. 
Yes, will someone please explain what is going on? Kirsten asks. I cannot have my only employee not report for work tomorrow. I sigh and run a hand through my dark hair. Molly and I met when we were in our early 20s. She was amazing, but I wasn't sure where my life was going. I look to Tristan. Remember, man? Kirsten's eyes travel between us. Okay, and what does that mean? I left California for a while to join the rodeo, I say, as I run my hand down my stubbled chin. Her eyes blink at me. The what? The rodeo? I guess you could say I had my midlife crisis early in life. I thought I wanted to be a bull rider, and I left with little more than an explanation to my family. So you left without a word to Molly? The accusation lay heavy in her voice. I did. I'm not proud of it, but I couldn't take her with me. Rodeo life is barely livable for the cowboy. It certainly is no place for a girlfriend. Kirsten shakes her head so forcefully that her dark hair swirls about her face. You should have given her the option. I know I should have. She was gone when I returned to California a few years later, and I never could find her, though I did try. I suck in a deep breath and sigh. Now I have the chance to make it up to her, but I have no idea how. Well, you better think of something. We can't work next to you as long as she hates you. I promise. I will figure something out. Chapter 2. Molly My feet are dragging as I pull into work. I can't bear the thought of seeing Dylan again. Though it's been years, he's never been far from my mind. I thought he was going to propose, but instead he disappeared without a word. Now he's back and working right next door? I don't know how I'm supposed to focus on work knowing that he is just 20 feet away. How are you doing? Kirsten asks as I step through the front door. Concern is etched in her expression and coloring her voice. It's refreshing to hear that she cares, but I really don't want to talk about it. I'm as fine as I can be, considering... Kirsten bites her bottom lip as she returns my gaze. I know you have a right to be angry, but aren't you always telling me not to jump to conclusions? Maybe you should hear what he has to say. I tuck my wallet in the secret place under the counter and pull on my apron. I'm not sure I care what he has to say. He left without a word, Kirsten. Any man who does that is not the kind of man I need in my life. No, I just need to figure out how to ignore him. Okay, Kirsten says with a sigh. Well, let me know if I can help you in any way. She walks toward the door to flip the sign to open and then turns to me. Will it bother you if I still see Tristan? It will, but I can't tell her that. She hasn't had the best luck with men, and if Tristan cares for her, I won't ask her to give that up. I worry, though. If Dylan is the type to love them and leave them, might Tristan be too? No, but you should be careful. They are brothers after all. She nods, and her eyes widen slightly as if she's just made the connection that the two might be similar. Good thinking. I will. Okay, you ready? I'm not, but at least the distraction of customers coming in will keep my mind off the man in the next building the man I had once thought I might spend my life with. Dylan. So have you thought of how to make it up to Molly? Tristan asks as we enter the building. The destruction inside is complete, and now it's time to rebuild it and make it our own. I sigh and set down my tool bag. I thought about it all night, but I'm drawing a blank. I mean, I suppose I could get flowers, but that gesture seems pretty meaningless. I want to do something that will touch her and let her know how truly sorry I am. In reality, I'd like to show her I still care for her, but for now I'd just settle with becoming friends again. Tristan sets down the flooring he was carrying and rubs his chin. What about interests? What was she into when you dated? Music and... I pause as I think back, trying to remember, and then the light bulb goes off. 
she gave up a job as a pastry chef. And chocolate. She loves chocolate. Okay, well, there's a cupcake shop down the road. Maybe begin by bringing her cupcakes every day. Just watch out for the woman who works there. She's pretty, but I think she's also thirsty. Thirsty? I ask, not catching his innuendo. Looking to snag her claws in a man, and I'm not sure it would matter which man. Ah, got it. I'll be sure and keep my guard up. Cupcakes. I still feel like Molly will need more, that she deserves more. But it's a start, so I make a plan to stop at the cupcake shop after work. When we finish for the day, Tristan agrees to take me to the shop as long as I promise not to take too long. He and Kirsten have plans for tonight. I'm happy for the guy. Really, I am. But if I can't get things mended with Molly, I have a feeling their relationship will nauseate me rather quickly. The cupcake shop he pulls into is sandwiched between two other buildings and barely looks big enough to hold a display case. Don't worry, he says, turning off the engine and facing me. The outside is deceiving. There is quite a selection inside. If you say so, I say as I unbuckle my seatbelt and open the door. His reading of my thoughts no longer surprises me. It's one of the nice things about being brothers. However, I am pleasantly surprised when I pull open the door of the shop. He wasn't exaggerating. The inside is more spacious than it appeared from outside. A perky brunette glances up at the jingle of the bell overhead, and immediately the hair on the back of my neck stands on end. Tristan wasn't exaggerating about her, either. Her eyes appraise me like I'm a choice steak at the market before her red lips split in a wide grin. I knew you'd be back, she says, shifting her glance to Tristan momentarily before it hones back in on me. And this must be your brother. The handsome Jean definitely runs in your family. Tristan flashes his I told you so smile at me before passing his charm to the woman. Hey, Tess, this is my brother Dylan. He's looking for some chocolate to win his way back into a woman's heart. Her smile freezes for just a second as the information sinks in. Of course, I'll be happy to help. Does she like any particular chocolate? Um, I approach the counter and peruse the offerings. Dark chocolate. Do you make any cupcakes with dark chocolate? Of course, we have chocolate of all kinds. Here's a triple chocolate, milk dark and white. She points to a dark cupcake with a checkered frosting. And we have our dark chocolate mousse. This time, her finger moves to a solid brown cupcake topped with a cherry. I scan the options, but it's been so long, I don't know exactly what Molly will like. You know what? I'll just take one of every chocolate cupcake you have. Tess blinks her doe eyes at me. All of them? Sure, why not? I say with a shrug. I can't imagine it's that many, but as she begins loading up the box, I quickly realize it's more than a dozen. Still, I don't stop her. I doubt cupcakes alone will be enough to win Molly over, but I might as well go big. Chapter 3. Molly. A sigh escapes my lips as I pull into the parking lot. Dylan stands in front of our door with a box in his hand. What do you want, Dylan? I hope he will just get out of my way, but he moves to block my entrance. I want to apologize, and I've brought you a peace offering. He holds the box out and smiles as if that will erase the years and past hurt. Great, apology accepted, I say, and push behind him to open the door. Don't you even want to know what's in it? He asks. There is a trace of hurt in his voice. Fine. I sigh and turn back to him, trying hard not to roll my eyes. He opens the cover of the box, and I almost burst out laughing. Inside are a dozen chocolate cupcakes. It is a checkerboard of white and brown frosting, dotted with some red cherries and colorful sprinkles. Please tell me you still like chocolate smalls. Smalls, his nickname for me. 
At the sound of the word, my heart warms a little. Just a little, though. Chocolate and a nickname, even one that always made me feel special, still don't make up for the past. Yet. But it is obvious he is trying, so I decide to cut the guy a little slack. I do still eat chocolate, I say with a slight smile. Good, because I have more coming, and I'd like to take you to dinner tonight, anywhere you'd like, or I'll cook for you. Our restaurant isn't finished yet, of course, but I'd be happy to cook for you at your place or mine. The words tumble out of his mouth like rapid-fire bullets, and I can't help but smile at him. Fine, dinner, but I'm not promising this gets you off the hook. He nods, the corners of his mouth twitching as if he's trying to hold back the smile. I understand. Shall I pick you up here or what? Yeah, here is fine. I get off at six. We can decide what to do for dinner after that. Sounds good. He hands me the box and turns to go. But before he enters the door of his restaurant, he pauses. I'm looking forward to it. I wish I could say I wasn't, but for all my bravada and tough exterior, I still have a soft spot for Dylan and find that I'm looking forward to it as well. The coffee shop is still dark as I enter, and I wonder briefly where Kirsten is. Normally here at the crack of dawn, I wonder if her night with Tristan ran long. I pull out one of the cupcakes to munch on as I prep for the morning rush. Even though I'm not really hungry, as I didn't skip breakfast, chocolate is a weakness of mine, and I know these cupcakes won't taste fresh much longer. Might as well try a few before they go stale. Dylan. Did you get your package delivered? Tristan asks as I enter the restaurant. Yes, she didn't want to take them at first, but I got her to, and she agreed to dinner tonight. We really need to get this restaurant open, though, because I have no idea where to take her in town. I'm not sure either, Tristan says, but I could ask Kirsten. I'll probably just offer to cook for her, but yeah, go ahead and ask. I glance around the room to see what we need to tackle today. It appears to be more flooring. We managed to get about a quarter of it done yesterday, but there's still a lot of floor left. You ready to tackle the rest of this? Tristan's lips twist into a smirk. Need to get your mind off her, huh? Six o'clock is a long way away, I say. It might go a little faster if we get some work done instead of yakking away. All right. Tristan holds up his hands in surrender and shakes his head. I get it. Been there and done that. Let's finish some flooring then. After a few minutes, we find a groove, and the floor seems to lay itself. When we place the final piece, we both stand and survey the room. It's amazing how different it looks. There's still a lot of work to be done, but with a new floor, it looks more finished than it is. We take a short break for lunch and then move on to the next project. Though I can't say time flies, it definitely feels faster keeping my mind on the work. When I notice the light in the room shift, I chance a glance at my watch. It's just after five. Hey, how about we call it a day today? I'd like to clean up before picking up Molly. Sweat dots my t-shirt, causing parts to cling to my arms and abs. Though I love the feeling of physical labor, I'd prefer not to be sweaty when I see Molly again. Tristan regards his watch. Yeah, okay. I wouldn't mind cleaning up either. We perform a quick cleanup, putting the tools back where they belong and removing any small pieces of flooring that weren't used, and then we are on our way back to the apartment. As I peel off my clothes and step under the warm water, I can't help but feel the nerves tightening in my stomach. Molly has given me a second chance, but she might not give me a third. This night has to go perfectly. Chapter 4 Molly. I tell Kirsten I'm fine to close by myself, but my stomach is twisting in agony. It began about an hour ago. First a simple pang, then a nodding sensation, but now it is a full-blown stretching and coiling pain that fluctuates between burning hot and icy cold. 
My stomach feels as if it's a cauldron, and all sorts of disgusting things have been thrown into it and stirred about. The front door closes, and my stomach clenches. I can feel the contents surging up my throat, and I reach the bathroom just in time to deposit them in the porcelain bowl. The first surge is followed by a second, and I wonder if any food remains in my stomach as I sit back. Molly, are you here? I groan as I recognize Dylan's voice. Dinner is out of the question, and I really don't want him to see me like this. But as I stand to wash my face, a dizziness descends upon me. My hands clutch the sink as I wait for the room to stay still. His footsteps carry down the hall, and he is in the doorway before I can release the sides of the sink. Molly, are you okay? I shake my head, just slightly because too much movement makes the room begin to spin again. I'm not. I'm sorry, but I don't think I can do dinner tonight. Don't worry about that. I just want to make sure you're all right. I'm about to say fine, but before the word reaches the tip of my tongue, I feel my stomach churn again. And though I thought my stomach was empty, it finds more stuff to spew out. Dylan steps into the bathroom and pats my back as if wanting to help but unsure how. We stay that way for another few minutes as my stomach calms again. Maybe we should take you to the doctor. No, I'm sure it's nothing. I'm... I can't finish the sentence as another convulsion grabs me. Okay, I say as I finish. Something is obviously wrong with me. I can't remember vomiting this much in ages. I don't know where the doctor is in this town, but I'll take you if you can show me the way. I nod, though I have no idea if I'll be able to keep from heaving long enough to give him directions. On our way out the door, I grab a giant bowl. Even with our troubled past, I don't want to leave Dylan's car a mess. Dylan Thankfully, Molly's stomach behaves long enough for her to give me directions to the small clinic. It sits on the outskirts of town and is a quaint two-story building. I park the car and then help her inside. Her skin has paled and dark circles have taken over her eyes, just in the short time since I found her half an hour ago. Worry boils inside me. What is wrong with her? Can I help you? A woman asks from the desk that sits prominently in the room. Molly opens her mouth to speak, but I beat her to it. She needs to see a doctor. She's been vomiting for over half an hour. The woman's eyes widen, and her body moves a few inches back. It is probably an unconscious gesture, but it bugs me nonetheless. She works at a clinic and should be used to sick people coming near her. Yes, of course. She taps a few keys on her computer. Dr. Johnson is just finishing with a patient, but I'll squeeze you in after that. Have you been here before? Molly nods and manages to give her information before rushing off to the bathroom. Did she eat anything that tasted funny today? The woman asks me as her eyes follow Molly. I don't know. I gave her cupcakes this morning, but I have no idea if she ate them. We were supposed to be having dinner, but when I arrived to pick her up, I found her this way. Could it be food poisoning from the cupcakes if she ate them? The woman shakes her head. I have no idea, but it might be possible. I rather hope so, because otherwise it sounds like a nasty stomach bug. A part of me also hopes it's food poisoning, as bad as that sounds. At least food poisoning passes quickly. A stomach bug might have her laid up for a few days, and I know how hard that would be on their shop. Still, if it is food poisoning, the fact that I might have caused it will be hard to deal with. Molly returns from the bathroom looking even paler than before. Sorry, she says as she sits down in one of the waiting room chairs. Hey, it's no big deal. I just hope it's nothing serious. A moment later, a nurse calls Molly back. I glance at her, wondering if she wants me to go with her, but she doesn't offer. I'll be here when you get done, I say to her back. 
She turns and flashes a small smile before disappearing behind the door. There is nothing to do now but wait. Chapter 5. Molly The paper crinkles as I sit on the bed. Dr. Samuel Johnson, Kirsten's brother, runs the thermometer over my head. He's handsome, but a little too stiff for me. Kirsten had hoped to set us up when I first moved to town, but she had quickly realized we wouldn't work well together. Well, you don't have a fever. That's good. Can you tell me what you ate today? He sits at the computer and begins typing into an electronic chart. Ignoring the pain and bubbling sensation in my stomach, I think back over the day. I had cereal for breakfast and cupcakes. His fingers pause and he turns to me, brows arched on his forehead. Cupcakes? Well, probably only two total, but Dylan brought me a dozen, and I felt the need to try them all before they got stale. The words sound silly now. What had I expected eating a ton of sugar for breakfast? Okay, cupcakes. Did anybody else eat them? I shake my head. Kirsten hates sweet foods, and no one else would have had access to them. All right, any other food? Um, I had a coffee for lunch and half a sandwich, but by that time my stomach was feeling weird, so I didn't eat much. What type of sandwich? Ham and cheese? I'm pretty sure it was ham and cheese, but I'd grabbed it at the supermarket on my way into work this morning and hadn't really looked at it. Nor did I remember the taste since most of my focus was on keeping my stomach calm. All right. Well, the good news is that you aren't going to die, though I know it feels like it. Unfortunately, since no one else is sick, I can't really tell if it's a stomach virus or food poisoning. Luckily for you, the treatment is about the same. Throw away the cupcakes and the sandwich, get some rest, and avoid greasy foods for the next few days. The thought of throwing away all those cupcakes pained me, but not as much as continuing to vomit. Still, how could cupcakes cause food poisoning? They didn't have meat or salad in them, the common culprits of food poisoning. But maybe the milk used had been bad or something? If that was the case, she owed Tess a visit as soon as she felt better. Thanks, Samuel. Any idea how long I'll be out of commission? Tomorrow is Saturday, and though I have no idea if it will be busy... I do know it will be almost impossible for Kirsten to run the shop herself. I don't. Unfortunately, that depends on you and what you have. If it's a stomach virus, it might be a few days. But food poisoning has been known to cause issues for up to five days as well. I drop my face into my hands and groan. Your sister is going to kill me. Samuel chuckles. Yeah, she's not going to be happy but she'll survive. Maybe she can find some temporary help somewhere. And that's when my mind jumps back to Dylan. He still owes me, maybe doubly now if the cupcakes are what made me sick. And while he may know nothing about coffee, he does have customer service skills, at least from what I remember. A small smile spreads across my face. I think I may know where she can find some. Dylan. I swallow the jealous feeling that erupts in me when I see the doctor place his hand on Molly's arm as they enter the waiting room. He's a decent-looking fellow with his blue eyes and dark hair, and the look he sends her direction tells me he finds her attractive as well. The question is, does Molly find him attractive? It's obvious she knows him, but I can't tell if her look is gratitude or something more. So lots of rest and liquids, promise? The doctor asks her. I promise, Molly says with a chuckle. I'll make sure she gets rest, I say, inserting myself into the conversation. The doctor flicks irritated eyes my direction. And you are... I shove my hand out. Dylan, Dylan Dixon, I'm... An old friend, Molly says, cutting me off. Her words cut to the quick. 
Is that all I am? An old friend? I suppose I should be glad she called me a friend at all with our past, but I don't want to be just a friend. I didn't then, although I didn't realize that until later, and I don't now. The doctor looks from Molly to me and back again before speaking. Well, it was good to see you again, Molly, and if my sister gives you too hard of a time, just have her call me. I'll tell her it was doctor's orders. Thanks, Samuel. Samuel? I ask when we exit the office. You're on a first-name basis with your doctor? Jealousy drips from my words, but I can't help it. Molly stops and shakes her head at me. This is a small town, Dylan. I'm on a first-name basis with almost everyone here. Plus, in case you weren't listening, he happens to be Kirsten's brother. So yeah, I know him pretty well. Besides, what business is it of yours? You left me, remember? I know, I say with a sigh. I'm sorry, I don't have a right to be jealous, but this was supposed to be my night to show you that I made a mistake. To make it up to you, and instead I have to watch him make a pass at you. Molly chuckles and places a hand on my arm. He did not make a pass at me. Samuel and I would never work. You might know that, but I saw the way he looked at you. This is one thing I both love and hate about Molly. She's pretty in this chic, edgy way with her short hair and piercings, but she doesn't know it. Most of the time, that's a good thing. It keeps her from becoming conceited, but it also keeps her from noticing when guys are falling all over her. Stop, she says. You and I have issues to work through, but Samuel is not one of them. Work through? I have no idea if she even knows what she just said, but it gives me hope. If she didn't see a future, we wouldn't need to work through anything. Molly, I'm sorry I left. I was scared because I was starting to see a future with you, and I wasn't ready. Dylan, she says, trying to stop me. But now that I've opened my mouth, I can't pull the words back. No, let me finish. I love you, Molly. I loved you then, though I didn't want to admit it. And I still love you. With that, I pause and wait for her to say something. Her eyes stare into mine, but I can't read what's going on in her head. You love me? I do, and I'll do anything to prove it to you. The words are out before I have fully thought them through, but it's too late to take them back now. Anything? I'm suddenly unsure I like the gleam in her eye or the challenging tone in her voice. But I've come this far, I might as well see it through. Anything. Okay, I do know of one way you can prove that you love me, that you're serious now, she continues, as I open the car door and she slides in. Name it. I'm expecting her to say flowers or chocolates or dinners and a movie for a week, but I am not prepared for what comes out of her mouth. I need you to help Kirsten with the shop until I'm better. But I don't know the first thing about making coffee. That's not entirely true. I can put grounds in a filter and press the button on a traditional coffee maker, but that is not specialty coffee. I can't make an Americano or a cappuccino, especially since I'm not even sure what the difference between them is. Well, Kirsten can show you, but she can also make the coffee. I know you can smile and welcome people in. I'm pretty sure you can run a register and give change. And though I've never seen you do it, I bet you can even wash dishes. She has me there. I can do all of those things if Kirsten can handle making the actual drinks. Okay, I'll be you until you feel better. Good. We open at 6, so plan to be there at 5 to help prep and get ready. I sigh slightly as I realize how much longer my day just got. But if this is what it takes to show Molly I still love her, then I will do it. Chapter 6. Dylan 
I am at the door the next morning when Kirsten arrives. She flashes me a timid, skeptical smile as she opens the door. I know I'm not Molly, but I've worked a lot of customer service jobs. I promise it will be okay until she gets back. Kirsten says nothing as she walks behind the counter and reaches down for something. Oh, I know it will be. She crosses back to me and holds out a folded piece of green fabric. I take it and let the fabric fall down. My heart sinks as I realize it's an apron. Company policy, she says, with a slight shrug of her shoulders as I stare at the apron. The twinkle in her eyes tells me she is enjoying this, and I begin to wonder if maybe Molly won't owe me after this is all over. Even though every masculine fiber in my body shudders at the thought of donning the apron, I slip it over my head. A promise is a promise, and I will be a good sport about this. Thankfully, the apron is simple. There are no frills or ruffles. I might have had to draw the line there. Okay, let's give you a brief rundown of everything, Kirsten says, taking charge. Though she has relaxed considerably in the time I've known her, all of a sudden I see the woman from the first day reemerge. I will do the specialty coffees, but you can make regular coffee, right? I mean, put the grounds in the filter and push the button? Yes, he can push button, I respond in a caveman-type voice. A smile breaks across her face. Sorry, I'm just a little nervous about this. It's my baby, you know? I get it. Look, I can make the regular coffee and wash the dishes and take money. I've got you covered. She lets out a long breath. I hope so. Okay, I'll skip the basics then and just tell you where everything is. That way you can give it to me if I need it. Sound good? Sounds perfect, I say with a nod, and try to keep up as she runs through all the ingredients and where everything is stored. It doesn't appear too hard. Milk and cream in the fridge, syrups and sugars on the back counter, coffee by the machine, Though I still have no idea what to expect, I think I will be fine. Kirsten shakes her head as she glances at her watch. Out of time, here we go. Don't worry, your customers will understand even if we aren't perfect. Thanks. This time, her smile is genuine, and after another deep breath, she opens the door and the stream of customers enter. I don't know if it's because word got out about Molly being sick or if business is finally picking up for them, but as I look out at the room, it appears there are more people here today than normal. I try not to let that concern me as the first customer approaches the counter and orders a drip coffee with room for cream. Drip coffee. That I can do. Molly. My stomach finally begins to settle about three in the afternoon. It has been a long 24 hours. I managed to keep my stomach in check during the appointment last night and the ride home with Dylan, but as soon as I tried to drink some fluids, it began churning again. After two or three more offerings to the porcelain god and a thorough toothbrushing after each deposit, I was finally able to crawl into bed. Sleep was fitful at best, but I did manage to rest a little. Around noon, I decided to attempt fluids once again, and though my stomach twisted, it kept the contents in. Unfortunately, sleep didn't return, so I turned on the TV. Not a big television fan, my attention wandered from one show to the next. I have no idea how people stay home and watch it all day, to me, that sounds about as boring as watching paint dry. When the doorbell rings, I push myself up from the couch and shuffle to the front door. Surprise floods me at the sight of Dylan. Oh no, did it go awfully? Actually, it went really well. Tristan decided to help out as well and take the afternoon shift so I could come check on you. He holds up a bag. I brought chicken soup and Sprite and crackers. He shrugs and offers a sheepish smile. I wasn't sure what you might be able to eat, but I'll get you anything else you need. 
I smile at his kindness before I realize I haven't showered or brushed my hair. I haven't brushed my teeth since this morning, but at least they have been brushed. My hand flies to my head and tucks a strand behind my ears. Don't worry, you look great. I should still be angry at him. He left me without a word. But I can see that he is trying so hard to be different, to show me he has changed, to take care of me, and so I step back and let him enter my sanctuary. I look like crap, but thank you. You might feel like crap, but you don't look like it. His eyes tear through me as he sets the bags down. They rip my carefully constructed wall to shreds, and when he steps toward me, I don't move. Molly, I... I don't care what he has to say. I can read his emotions in his eyes, and I want the comfort he's offering. Hoping my stomach will behave, I lean up and wrap my arms around his neck. His eyes register surprise for just a moment, before his arms find the small of my back and then our lips are touching. Remembering the past, exploring the difference, bridging the years. This may be the stupidest thing I've ever done, but at this moment, I don't care. I simply allow myself to enjoy the feel of being in his arms once again. Does that mean you've forgiven me? He asks with an impish smile when we part. It means I'm willing to give you another chance, I say. Now, less talking and more catching up, please. Absolutely. I'm always happy to oblige. Chapter 7. Dylan. I'm still riding high when I return to the apartment that night. Good afternoon, Tristan asks as I walk in the door. He is sprawled across the couch in shorts and a t-shirt and looks ready for bed. I bite back the smile tugging at my lips. It was a good afternoon. And evening. Thanks for taking my place so I could visit her. How did your shift go helping Kirsten? I plop down in the recliner across the room from him. Good, Tristan says with a chuckle, and then shakes his head. But I'm glad I'm not working for her on a daily basis. The drill sergeant we met the first day reappeared. I laugh and nod. Yeah, I saw her too, but she seems pretty cool when she relaxes. She is cool. So, are you and Molly getting back together? My mind flashes back to the kiss, or kisses, as there was definitely more than one. Yeah, I think so, but I think I'm on probation until she's sure. I guess with your past, that's understandable, but perhaps we can help solidify the deal. My eyes narrow at him. Tristan has always been the schemer between the two of us. He got me in more trouble than I want to admit when we were growing up. What do you mean? I'm not hypnotizing her if that's what you're thinking. I'm referring to the time he tried to hypnotize our mother into not giving us chores. After watching a few videos, Tristan had been confident he could draw her under. But after two minutes, she had simply sent us both upstairs and doubled our chore load. Okay, first off, I've gotten a lot better at hypnotizing. Now it's just natural. I roll my eyes as he sticks out his chest. But seriously, I meant a double date. Molly and Kirsten are friends. We're brothers. What could go wrong? Those were his famous last words. What could go wrong indeed? Usually, everything. But this time he might be onto something. A double date would not only be fun, but relaxing. With all of us, I could open up and really show Molly that this time I mean to stick around for good. You're right. That does sound fun. Let's see if they're up for it tomorrow night. Tomorrow night? Tristan asks incredulously. I take it Molly is feeling better then? She certainly hadn't seemed sick while kissing me, but I honestly have no idea if she was just being a trooper or if she were feeling better. I had meant to ask, but when her lips touched mine, all those thoughts had flown out of my head. I think so, I say slowly. 
I really hope so, because I don't think I can barista again. I'm more tired today than I've been in a long time. I hadn't even realized how tired I was until the words exit my mouth. But now the exhaustion covers me and I struggle to keep my eyes open. Me too, he says, and we share a chuckle before turning in for the night. Molly. The restaurant is hopping as we enter. Of course, being the only sit-down restaurant in town, it is often happening, but tonight seems busier than usual. Will we be able to find a table? Dylan asks in a raised voice. His eyes are scanning the room. Don't worry, Kirsten knows the owner here. We'll get a table. Although, as I look around, I wonder where. It appears every booth and table in this place is full currently. How many? The hostess asks as we step toward the podium. Four, Kirsten answers. But can you tell Yuri that it's Kirsten and her friends? I'm sorry, Yuri isn't working tonight, the hostess says. I can get you a table, but it will probably be 10 to 15 minutes. Kirsten turns to us. Is 15 minutes too long? I shake my head. It's fine with me. Truth be told, I'm still babying my stomach anyway. Though I managed to get through work today, I didn't deviate much from the brat suggestion of bananas, rice, apples, and toast. Those appeared to agree with my stomach, but I can't order that here, and I have no idea what this food will do to me. Tristan and Dylan exchange glances but nod as well. Fifteen minutes should be fine. As we cross to the waiting area, Dylan leans close to me. I sure hope we can entice some of this crowd to come to our restaurant when we open. Do you plan to be a casual restaurant like this? I ask as we sit down. Yes, but maybe a step up. Steak and pasta, that sort of thing, instead of just burgers and salads. Then you'll probably be fine, I say with a smile. Besides, the best thing about opening up a restaurant in a small town is that there isn't much competition, so people will come. It appears that extends beyond just business, Kirsten says. Her voice is tight and pinched, and I follow her gaze to see what she's staring at. Is that Samuel? I ask as the familiar face of her brother comes into view. Yep. And who is that with him? I can only see the girl's hair, but as if someone whispered in her ear that eyes were watching her, she chooses that moment to turn and my jaw drops. Is that Tess? Yep. Kirsten's face has tightened to match her voice, and I can almost see the smoke wisping out of her ears. What is he doing with her? It's a facetious question, one that doesn't require an answer but she gives one anyway. I don't know, but I'm about to find out. She stands, and before I can stop her, she is marching across the floor to confront the two. What's going on? Dylan asks as he leans closer again. Nothing good. Come on. The end. If you enjoyed this story, please leave a review. Just a few words helps. Want to find out what is going on between Tess and Samuel? Be sure to check out Small Town Rivals. Chapter 1. Tess. I look up at the sound of angry heels clopping across the floor. Oh no, what is she doing here? What do you think you are doing, Tess? Kirsten asks me. Actually, asks is too nice of a word. She practically spits the words at me, and I'm pretty sure she's laced them with venom first and hopes that when they hit my face, the poison will sink in and kill me. Pasting my sweetest smile on, the one that won me the title of Homecoming Queen, Prom Queen, and Miss Small Town USA, I glance up at her and bat my eyes. I'm having dinner, Kirsten. What does it look like? It looks like you are having dinner with my brother. Her angry eyes flash at me, and then she turns her daggers on Samuel. 
Why are you having dinner with my brother? Why are you having dinner with her? Samuel shrugs. We were hungry, and we thought food might take that hunger away. I bite back a chuckle. He's cute. His looks first grabbed my attention when he entered my shop yesterday morning. I've long been a sucker for dark hair and blue eyes, but when I found out he was Kirsten's brother, my interest grew. And now I find out he has a sense of humor, too. There could really be something here. Too bad Kirsten didn't seem to get the same sense of humor, Jean. Hey, Samuel. Tess. Kirsten's friend Molly says as she comes up behind her. Close behind are the two handsome newcomers, Tristan and Dylan Dixon. Kirsten, come on, our table is ready. Molly tugs on Kirsten's arm, clearly wishing to avoid a scene. Kirsten narrows her eyes at me and then at Samuel. This isn't over. We will talk about this again. Soon. Then she spins and clops back across the floor. Sorry about that, Samuel says. I don't know what's gotten into her. I do, and I can't really blame her. I did spread a rumor she was pregnant in high school with a boy's baby who wasn't her boyfriend. My goal, of course, was to try and convince her boyfriend he was better off with me. It worked, but unfortunately he and I didn't. We broke it off just days later, and Kirsten and I didn't speak again until about a week ago when she and Tristan entered my shop. Maybe this was a bad idea, I say, laying on the reverse psychology I am so skilled at. I wouldn't want to come between you and your sister. No, she'll get over it. He says the words with confidence, but his face betrays him. He isn't so sure of that statement. And besides, even if she doesn't, she has no say in who I date. I bite the corner of my lip and smile coyly up at him. Dating Samuel would have been fun without Kirsten in the picture, but tormenting her as well makes it twice as fun. Well, if you're sure, I am having a lovely time with you. His hand snakes across the table and covers mine. Me too, he says and I know that I have him hooked. Samuel I know what Kirsten is going to say before she even opens her mouth. How could you go on a date with her? She throws her hands up in frustration as she paces around my living room. Her gait is so aggressive that grooves are already forming from her steps. She better not destroy my carpet. You know what she did to me in high school. Kirsten, that was high school, ten years ago, in case you've forgotten. I'm sure she's changed since then. And even if she hasn't, she's fun. Maybe it won't be anything serious, but beautiful women like Tess don't pop up in this small town very often, and I haven't been on a date in ages. Part of that is my practice, which, as the only doctor in town, keeps me very busy, but the other part is just that I haven't found a woman I wanted to go out with until now. I don't even know what brought me into Miss Moffat's cupcakes yesterday, as I don't generally eat sweets, but for some reason I was craving something homemade and carby. And there had been Tess, looking more like a movie star than an employee, as she stood behind the counter and flashed her megawatt smile at me. She'd always been pretty, even back in high school, but I'd been a year older and more focused on medical school than dating. Then she had spread the rumors about Kirsten, and even if I had wanted to date her, I couldn't have. The house full of women I was living in then would have eviscerated me. For the most part, I didn't mind being the only boy in a family of girls, but when it came to the petty revenge and retribution stuff, I missed having a brother. Boys would have just punched each other and gotten over it, but girls held grudges forever, it seemed. As evidenced by Kirsten's still bruised feelings ten years later. Maybe that was high school, but she also made a pass at Tristan. I raise my brow at her. Tristan? 
You mean the new guy in town that you've been dating for, what, a week? You know how rare it is to get new people in this town? Especially people our age. Can you blame her for trying? She sucks in a ragged breath and spears me with her livid gaze. I can't believe you are on her side. I'm your sister. You're supposed to be on my side. I'm not on anyone's side, I say, throwing up my hands. I simply think you are being ridiculous. Is Tristan interested in Tess? She folds her arms across her chest and sticks out her bottom lip. No, of course not. Okay, so you've got nothing to worry about. And I'm your brother, so it's not like there is any possibility of us dating. Besides, if she's dating me, she's less likely to turn her attention to anyone else, right? Right? I can see from the expression on her face that she knows I'm making sense. She doesn't like it, but she knows I'm right. So she changes tactics. But what about you? What if she hasn't changed and she breaks your heart? I'm 30 years old, Kirsten. I think I can handle myself. As her mouth pulls into a tight line, I know I have won the argument. Fine, but when she tears you to pieces like the man-eater she is, don't come crying to me. And don't expect me to be buddy-buddy with her either. I chuckle and shake my head. I would never expect that. Kirsten has always been fierce and independent. I learned a long time ago to stop expecting things from her. She is a great sister and loyal to the core. But when she decides on something, there is no getting her to budge. Still, I wouldn't change her for the world. Chapter 2. Tess I knock quietly on my mother's door before opening it. She's been suffering from migraines recently, which is why I've returned home to help her with the shop. Well, that and the fact that my life was in shambles in Dallas. Okay, not shambles exactly, but certainly not where I thought it would be. When I left after high school, I'd had big plans— join a sorority, marry a doctor, maybe do some interior decorating on the side. And the first two had been easy. I joined the biggest sorority on campus, and that's where I met Doug. He was in the largest fraternity, and he had aspirations of becoming a plastic surgeon. That should have been my warning sign, but plastic surgeons make good money. So I'd continued to see him, we married shortly after college, and for a few years, everything was great. But then he'd started pointing out areas he could fix on me. I've never had low self-esteem, but suddenly I was starting to. When I caught him with his 20-year-old receptionist, I knew I had to leave before he upgraded me for the latest model. Unfortunately, I hadn't applied myself as much in college as I could have, choosing instead to coast by with my charm and good looks. So finding a job was harder than I thought. Couple that with the fact that my well-known ex was very persuasive and very unhappy I'd filed for divorce, and finding a decent job became almost impossible. When my mother reached out to me and asked me to come home, my first response was a firm no. But after looking around my life, I realized the small town where I grew up couldn't be much worse than where I was currently. So I'd relented and returned home. The room is dark as I push open the door. My mother has the shades drawn tight, allowing very little light inside. She lays motionless in the bed, and for a moment, I wonder if she is still breathing. Mom, are you okay? I'm careful to keep my voice low. Lights and sound are huge triggers for her recently. Tess? Her voice is barely above a whisper. I pick up her hand and squeeze it. I'm here, Mom. Do you think you could get me some water and maybe a piece of toast? Don't you think you should eat more than just that, Mom? 
I don't even know when she's last eaten a real meal. No, just toast for now. Okay, Mom. I try to keep the concern out of my voice, but this is not normal. When Mom had migraines when I was younger, she'd be out for a few hours, but never this long. And I never remember her skipping meals. Perhaps it's time she saw someone, and I know just who to call. Samuel. Worry builds as I continue my examination of Tess's mother. Migraines are a normal part of life, but not to the debilitating effect she is having them. My mind jumps to worst-case scenarios. Is it bad? Tess's normal haughtiness is gone, replaced with a nervous concern that makes her more beautiful than ever. I don't know yet. I'd like her to come to my clinic so I can perform a more thorough examination and run some tests. I try to keep my voice calm. There's no need to worry Tess more than she already is until I've run tests. Okay, can I drive her? I can drive you both. Does she have sunglasses? She'll probably need them, and maybe a cover for her head to block whatever light the glasses don't. Tess bites her lip for a second and then nods. Yeah, I think so. I'll be right back. After she dashes off, I pull out my cell phone and call my lead nurse. Jennifer, can you make sure the MRI machine is ready? And call the neurosurgeon at the nearest hospital. I'm going to want his opinion. I finish the call just as Tess returns. She holds a pair of glasses, headphones, and a scarf. Will these do? She asks, holding out her arms. They should do fine, I tell her, as we return to her mother's room. Tabitha, we're going to take you to my clinic for some further tests. Tess has brought you some glasses and a scarf to help block as much of the light as possible, and headphones if the noise gets to be too much. Is this really necessary? She asks in a quiet voice. Mom, you've barely eaten in three days, and you haven't moved from this bed except to use the bathroom. I would say it is very necessary. Tess keeps her voice quiet, and I'm struck again by how soft and kind it is. I know this feels impossible right now, but I do believe you will feel better once we can determine what's wrong with you and get you some help, I add, hoping it will convince her enough to go along with us. She is so weak that I could carry her, but I always prefer to give patients the choice. Fine. Resignation fills her voice, but she holds out her hands for the items and then allows us to help her sit up. It is a slow walk to the car, as she must stop every few feet to catch her breath. But finally, we reach my vehicle. Her lack of energy and nausea weighs on me. I hope, for Tessa's sake, that this is just a really bad migraine bout, but I'm doubting that is the case. After loading Tabitha in the back and making sure she is comfortable, Tess and I climb into the front seats. I have no words for her, but after I start the engine, I grab her hand and squeeze it lightly. She gives me a small smile. It's not much, but at least she knows I care. Chapter 3. Tess Brain tumor? Are you sure? I am sitting in Samuel's office so that he can make sense of the test results for me, but I still can't seem to make the words work in my head. How could she have a brain tumor? My mother isn't as young as she used to be, but she's barely over 50 and in good shape. Samuel nods, and I try not to drown in the sympathetic blue depths of his eyes. That's what the neurosurgeon said. He wants to do a biopsy, but he believes it might be benign. A seed of hope sprouts in my chest. That's good, right? If it's benign, it won't need surgery or radiation. Probably not radiation, but it will still need to be removed. The tumor appears to be pressing on a nerve, which is what is causing your mother's headache and nausea. If we leave it alone, her symptoms will never get better and could end up getting worse. The sprout of hope turns black and withers away. 
So what does that entail? He shakes his head. It's not my area of expertise, and we can't do it here. She can stay here for the biopsy, and until he decides on a course of treatment, but then she will be moved to a hospital for the procedure. I know it generally involves a short hospital stay after the surgery and follow-up visits. Do you have any idea how long she will be out of commission? I want to be there for my mother, but the cupcake shop is so small that we don't have any other workers. I suppose I could shut the shop down for a few days, but the money hasn't been rolling in as it is. I'm afraid if I shut the doors that we may lose the few customers we have. My guess would be a week, but I really don't know. He rises from his chair and walks around the desk to where I'm sitting. His hand reaches out to me, and I place mine in his. With a smooth movement, he pulls me up and against his chest. His strong arms encircle my waist, and I allow myself to be vulnerable for a moment, placing my head on his chest. I can hear his heartbeat, and the woodsy scent of his cologne nestles itself in my memory. I had pictured this moment, what it would feel like to be in his arms, but it was always followed by a passionate kiss. Now I can't imagine that kiss. The need for passion has fled, replaced with worry for my mother. But I do appreciate the feeling of security that his arms give. If only I knew what to do from here. This is a lot to take in, he says, moving one hand from my back to the back of my head. I promise you, though, that we will do everything we can for your mother. I nod, but for the first time in my life, I am scared. Samuel, thanks for coming, I say, glancing around the room. I'm not exactly sure what to do to help Tess, but I hope these people, my family and friends, will have some ideas. What's going on, Samuel? Is this about Tess? Kirsten has her arms folded across her chest. I know she will be my toughest opposition, but I will probably need the most help from her. Let him speak. Hannah, my other sister, speaks up from the other side of the room. Demure and quiet, Hannah is the epitome of a librarian stereotype. She is also much calmer than Kirsten and willing to listen. Kirsten's lips purse together, but she waves her hand for me to continue. Tess just found out her mother has a brain tumor. Molly and Hannah gasp, and Kirsten has the decency to look chagrined. The doctor believes it's benign, but it will have to be removed because it's pressing on a nerve. Her mother can barely get out of bed. It will require a hospital stay, and Tess wants to be there for her mother. What can we do? Hannah asks. I take a deep breath. I'm hoping they will be open to this idea, but it hinges on Kirsten. Tess will have to be away from the shop for a few days, maybe a week. You guys know how fast business can disappear if you aren't open in a small town like this. I was hoping you guys might help me run her shop until she's back. The girls and my high school friends Jim and Trevor exchange glances. I know I'm asking a lot, but I hope they will agree. I know that we would all do it if Kirsten had to shut down her coffee shop for a bit, or Hannah the library, or even Jim who runs the insurance agency in town. I can help in the mornings, Hannah says. Kelsey, who recently graduated, is home right now, and she's been working a few hours. I can have her come in a little earlier and give you a few hours. I can cover a few hours around lunchtime, Jim says with a nod. It's generally our slowest time, and my receptionist can handle the calls until I return. Thank you. I turn my gaze to Kirsten, Molly, and Trevor. I can do some baking, Molly says. I assume we're going to need inventory. Baking? I hadn't even thought of that, but of course we will need products. What if we sell her cupcakes out of our coffee shop? Kirsten asks. I hesitate, but Kirsten continues. Hear me out. If we all go to her shop, there will probably only be one person there at a time. 
However, if we bring the cupcakes to our coffee shop, Molly and I will be there all day, and everyone else can stop in and help. That will allow Molly to bake during the day if needed as well. She does have a point, Trevor says. I don't have big chunks of time, but if others were there, I could stop in between my appointments. You'd be willing to do that for Tess? I ask Kirsten. I still worry that if we close her store, even with a sign letting customers know what is going on that it will hurt her business, but Kirsten does make sense. She shakes her head. No, but I'll do it for you. Okay, then. I'll float the idea to Tess, and I'll let you all know when we will start. Chapter 4. Tess So the doctor thinks a week, a day in the hospital before the surgery to prep, and then five days of recovery after. What am I going to do, Samuel? I can't close the shop for that long. I sigh and drop my head into my hands. I have a possible solution he says, and I lift my head a little. I asked my sisters and friends if they would be willing to help you out. What would you say if we moved your cupcakes to Kirsten's coffee shop for the week you are gone? We'll leave a sign on the door so your customers know it's just temporary. Kirsten and Molly will be there all day, and Hannah, Jim, Trevor, and I will help out when our schedules allow. He reaches across the table and takes my hands in his. My mouth drops open. Kirsten is willing to do that for me? I cannot see myself doing the same for her if the tables were turned, and that sobers me for a minute. What kind of a person am I? His eyes shift away from mine, but his thumb strokes the top of my hand. Well, not for you, but for me. Still, it's a step. Perhaps this will give you guys some ground to reconnect. Or give her the opportunity to run me out of business. I'm sure it's not true. Even Kirsten wouldn't go that far. I don't think. But I can't keep the snide comment from escaping my lips. He pulls his hands back and crosses his arms, leaning away from me. Immediately, I regret the words. Kirsten wouldn't do that. She might have been reluctant to help initially, but she wouldn't deliberately try to ruin your business. I lean forward to try and mend the rift. You're right. I'm sorry. I'm just worried about my mom. And to be honest, I don't trust a lot of people. So I've noticed. His guard is still up, but he allows me to grab his hand. You should learn to try, though. Don't you think you've pushed people away long enough? And suddenly, I wonder if he is right. I've been pushing people away since my parents divorced when I was 12. If the people who loved me the most couldn't stay together for me, then what hope was there for anyone else? But suddenly, I see the benefit of friends, of people who will help me when I need it. And I want that. Actually, I do. It's going to take some time, but I'd like to learn to be more trusting. And I'm going to start right now by accepting your help and thanking your sister. A wide smile covers his face and he laces his fingers through mine. I think that's a great idea. It is one thing to say it, but I'm having a much harder time doing it as we approach Kirsten's coffee shop. What if she doesn't believe me? What if she really is out to destroy my business and Samuel just doesn't know it? I swallow my fears and take a deep breath. I trust him. I'm not sure why, as I don't even know him that well, but I do. He places a hand on the small of my back, and that simple touch gives me the courage to open the door. Kirsten and her friend Molly stand behind the counter. They both look our direction as the door opens, and I wish there were more people inside as the conversation seemed to freeze at our entrance. Welcome to Perk Up, Molly says. But though I don't know her well, I can tell the brightness in her voice is forced. Yes, welcome, Kirsten echoes stiffly. What can we get for you? 
I don't drink coffee, never could stand the taste of it. Not since my father made me try a sip when I was five. But I'm not here to say that. I'm here to offer a white flag, a peace offering. Can I get a green tea? Sure, coming right up, Molly says, and spins around before Kirsten can offer to help. I swallow the pride in my throat as I catch Kirsten's eyes. I wanted to say thank you as well. Samuel told me about the plan to help out my business while my mother is in the hospital. I know we've had our issues in the past, but I wanted to tell you I'm sorry and I appreciate what you are doing. Her mouth opens and Samuel clears his throat behind me. Her eyes flick to Samuel before returning to me. You're welcome, and I hope your mother feels better. It's not the reaction I was hoping for, but it's better than I deserve, really, and I can't blame her for not embracing my change with open arms. Samuel. I'm proud of you, I say, when I drop Tess off at Miss Moffat's later. I know how hard it can be apologizing to my sister, believe me. I chuckle as I think back to all the times my mother forced me to apologize. Times when I was in the wrong, but didn't want to admit it. Tess nods, but it is clear her mind is miles away. I'm sure her mother is consuming her focus. I know mine would be, especially with my medical knowledge. Would it be all right if I prayed for you? Her eyes focus on me. There is a clarity, but questions also swim in them. You pray? Not as much as I should, probably, but I've seen too many miracles in my line of work to not believe in a creator. I guess it would be okay then. It certainly couldn't hurt. I take her hands in mine and close my eyes. Lord, I pray that you will put your healing hand on Tessa's mother for the surgery and the healing process after and I pray that you will grant her peace during all of this. In your name, amen. Thank you, she says, and wipes a tear from her eye. I know you are scared. I pull her closer to my chest and tilt up her face. But it will be okay. This surgery is performed often, and the doctor is a good one. It's just so much... I don't know if this is the time, but the vulnerability radiates off her and the desire to kiss her burns strong within. I know. My voice is husky as I trace a finger across her lips. Her mouth parts, and that is all I can take. I lower my face to hers. As our lips touch, heat floods my body. It has been a long time, too long, since I have kissed a woman and even longer since a kiss has affected me. Her hands hesitate momentarily, but then they are around my neck, keeping my head close to hers. When the heat becomes too much, I pull back and brush her hair away. I'm going to go to bed before I take advantage of the moment, but I'll check in on you tomorrow, okay? Okay. The word is soft and breathy, and her eyes still appear dazed, but she nods. It takes all my willpower to walk out of the shop. I don't know where this is going, but I want to take it slow and do it right. Chapter 5. Tess. My mom appears even thinner as I enter the room. The lights are dim, and she has an eye mask covering her eyes as well. Hey mom, how are you feeling today? I am careful to keep my voice soft so as not to hurt her ears. Her hand lifts slowly and pushes the mask up. Tess, what are you doing here? Shouldn't you be at the shop? Even as bad as she feels, her worry is for her business. I can understand it, but I hate it. She should be focusing on herself and not a cupcake shop right now. It makes me wonder if this is a common issue for her and if I should have done more in the last few years to help her. I'm here for you, Mom. Your surgery is today. Don't worry about the shop. I have some friends who are helping out. My voice catches on the word friends. How long has it been since I've had friends? 
friends who would step up to the plate and help others around them. Oh, that's good. We can't lose the business, Tess. It's all that I have left. Her words pierce my heart, and my years of selfishness flash across my eyes. How long has my mother been suffering while I did what I wanted? Too long. I decide then and there that I am going to change, that I am going to be better and help her out more. Don't worry, Mom. I won't let the business fail. I hold her hand and sit with her until the team comes to take her away. And then I sit in the silence of her room for a little longer. I should go check on the business, make sure that Kirsten isn't running it into the ground. But I am torn. The hospital is an hour outside of town. And though the doctors have told me that my mother's surgery might take three, I am hesitant to leave. What if she is done early and I'm not here when she returns? What if something happens to her and they can't find me? No, I'm simply going to trust. I'm going to trust Samuel that everything will be okay. Trust that Kirsten is basically a nice person and trust that Samuel's creator is looking out for me. But it's a lot harder than it seems. Samuel. Molly, these look amazing, I say, as I spy the glass containers she has set up on the counter. Kirsten's shop doesn't have the regular muffin display case that Miss Moffat's does, and it would have been too unwieldy to move anyway. But Molly has found several glass containers, like the ones that display cakes, and has stacked a myriad of muffins, brownies, and other treats inside. They fill up the coffee counter and spill out onto another table I've never noticed before. Where did that table come from? I ask, pointing to the table at the back. It is draped in a nice tablecloth and candles have even been set up around it. Tristan and Dylan brought that over from their place next door, Kirsten says as she rings up a customer. She places some of the money in her till, but the other bills are dropped into a large bucket. What's the bucket for? I ask, as I don an extra apron and join her behind the counter. That's Tessa's money. I thought it might be too hard to separate it after, so we deposit the cash she earns right away. Of course, I'll still have to separate the credit card payments at the end of shift, but this helps a little. I had no idea how much extra work this would pile on Kirsten, and I place a hand on her arm. Thank you. Again, you're being really great about this. Kirsten blows out a breath and shakes her head. She just better be worth it. I ponder those words as I help serve coffee and cupcakes to customers for the next few hours. When I first met Tess, I had wanted to date her because she was pretty, and women in this town were hard to come by. But lately, I've seen more to her. Though I would never wish illness on people, this scare with her mother appears to be grounding her, causing her to see things in a different light, and I wonder if there could be a future with her. There is definitely chemistry. I feel the heat creep up my neck as I think back to the kiss from the day before. But is there more than that? I'm not sure, but I want there to be. Though I don't have an internal clock like Hannah and Kirsten do, pushing me to have kids, I do want them, and I'm certainly not getting any younger. I'd like to be able to play football with my son or dolls with my daughter while I can still move nimbly. But is Tess the one? I guess there's only one way to find out. Chapter 6 Tess I squeeze Samuel's hand as the orderly helps my mother into the wheelchair. It's been a long week staying at the hospital, but finally my mother has been cleared to leave. I'm no doctor, but it is apparent that she is feeling better. Her skin has regained its color, her eyes are bright again, and her migraine has disappeared. She still has a few days of recovery ahead of her and the doctor made me promise she wouldn't work longer than two or three hours at a time to start with. But I'm okay with all of that because she's going home. 
I'm so exhausted, I whisper to Samuel. I've spent most nights here at the hospital just in case she woke up, and the lack of sleep is definitely taking its toll on me. I want a shower and a long nap. He smiles and kisses my forehead. I think that can be arranged. I don't have anything going on tonight, so I can sit with your mother while you catch up on sleep. My heart warms at his words. I'm not sure why he's dating me in the first place, especially with my history with Kirsten, but he has proven to be an amazing man. Though he wasn't able to drive out to the hospital every night, he always called to check up on me and tell me how the business was going. I began to look forward to those calls, and a part of me hopes they won't stop just because we'll be closer now. You are amazing, I say, and place a quick kiss on his lips. I am looking forward to another soul-shattering kiss like we shared over a week ago, but this one will do for now. Okay, you lovebirds, my mother says. Can we go home now? I haven't seen my room in nearly a week, and I'd like to check in on my shop. Of course. I look to Samuel to get his confirmation that our surprise is still on. Though we haven't had a lot of time together, he thought it would be amazing if we brought my mother to Kirsten's shop for her to see the display there and meet the people who helped out. He nods and we fall into step beside the orderly as he pushes mother out to the main entrance. As Samuel jogs out to pull the car around, my mother looks up at me. Be nice to him, Tess. He's a keeper. I know, Mom. It bothers me that she feels the need to warn me to be nice, but then I haven't always been the best partner in relationships. My view is changing, though. Her experience has shown me that life is too short to play games. Good, because I don't want you to end up alone like me. You're not alone, Mom. You have me. She smiles and pats my hand, but I know it's not the same. She wants a companion, someone to share evenings and mornings with, someone to drive her to doctor's appointments and hold her hand when she's scared. Samuel pulls up with the car, and as I watch him open the door for my mother and help her in, I realize that's what I want too. I just hope I can be the woman he deserves. Samuel What are we doing here? Tess's mother asks as I pull into the parking lot of Perk Up. This isn't my store. I know, but my sister said she had something for me. It will just take a minute, and I bet she'll make you a coffee or tea on the house, I say. Tabitha narrows her eyes at me, but agrees. Fine, as long as it's a short stop. I turn the engine off and help her out. Tess takes her other arm and we make our way up the short sidewalk. As I pull open the door, the small crowd inside shouts, Surprise! Tabitha's fingers dig into my arm and I hope we haven't scared her. That had certainly not been my intention. What is this? She asks as she surveys the room and the welcome home banner that Kirsten or Molly has hung across the back wall. We thought you'd like to meet the friends who helped us out, Mom. See, I couldn't keep the shop open and be there with you, so these lovely people all offered to help out. Unfortunately, they also all have full-time jobs, so instead of leaving the shop sparsely manned, we brought it here. I baked the cupcakes every day, Molly says, stepping forward. I'm sure they weren't as good as yours, but I did train as a pastry chef. I'm Molly, by the way. I'm Hannah, Samuel's sister, and I helped bake and wait on customers in the morning, Hannah says as she steps forward. We helped in the afternoon, Jim and Trevor say after introducing themselves. And I'm Kirsten. I know this isn't the same as your shop, but the customers loved having cupcakes and coffee. She reaches behind the counter and brings forth a bucket and a check. Here's the money you earned this week. I kept the cash separate, and the check here is for all the credit card payments. 
Tabitha's eyes glisten as she looks around the room. You all did this for me? For Tess and I? That's what friends are for, I say as I squeeze her arm. Thank you. Her voice is soft and choked with emotion. Thank you all so much. I lean back to catch Tess's eyes and am surprised to see hers glistening as well. Chapter 7. One Month Later. Tess. Will you please try this coffee? Kirsten asks as she hands a cup out to me. Ever since we combined our stores, she has made it her mission to find a coffee I might like. I guess it's fair, as my mother and I have been trying to find a dessert she and Tristan will enjoy. I take the coffee, expecting it to be bitter and burnt tasting as all coffee does to me, but there is a soft, smooth flavor in the sip. After swallowing, I take another sip just to be sure the first wasn't a fluke. Then I lift my eyes to meet her gaze. Okay, this isn't bad. What is this? It's a cafe breve with white chocolate and caramel cream. That was my suggestion, Molly pipes up from the sink where she is washing dishes. She has turned out to be quite the chef, and sometimes I take over making drinks for her so she can whip up some of her desserts. It's pretty good. A little rich, maybe, and not something I could drink every day, but it's good. Yes! Kirsten pumps her fist in the air. I knew I'd find something you would drink eventually. I chuckle at her exuberance. It took a few days of us working together and another apology on my part, but I think Kirsten has finally forgiven me. And strangely, we're actually becoming pretty good friends, something I never thought would happen in a million years. You know, I'm going to do the same, I say. I'm going to find a dessert you and Tristan will enjoy. Good luck with that. Did I hear my name? Tristan says as he enters the shop with Dylan right behind him. Tess here is determined to find a dessert we enjoy, Kirsten says, as she crosses to him and places a soft kiss on the corner of his mouth. I've got all the sweetness I can handle right here, he says, as he wraps his arms around her and kisses her back. That was so sappy, man, Dylan says when they part. You're just jealous, Tristan tosses back, but I doubt that. Molly and Dylan are just as cute together as Kirsten and Tristan, maybe even more so due to their previous history. Yeah, that's it. Molly, you ready? Yep, give me just a second. She finishes the dishes and then turns to me. Are you sure you're going to be okay to close? I feel badly that we are leaving you alone. Don't worry about me, I say with a laugh. I'm going to clean up here and then Samuel is taking Mom and me out for dinner. Tell him to take you somewhere nice, Kirsten says. You and your mother could use a nice sit-down place with people waiting on you, and he can afford it. I smile and wave goodbye as the two couples exit the shop. Then I begin to pack up the cupcakes, marveling at where my life is now. My mother and I are working with Kirsten and Molly, something I never would have thought could happen. I'm dating a wonderful man, and I'm happy. Truly happy for the first time in a long time. The door opens, and I flash a smile at Samuel as he enters. You ready? He asks. Ready? I am. I'm ready for a real relationship, ready for friends, and ready for whatever life throws at me. The end. If you liked this story, please leave a review. Small Town Rivals. Just a few words really helps. Want to find out how Kirsten's, Molly's, and Tess's story ends? Be sure to check out Small Town Life, the special epilogue short story. Chapter 1. Tabitha. As I watch my daughter Tess leave the cafe with her boyfriend Samuel, I can't help but feel a tiny twinge of jealousy. I am happy she has found someone, and relieved. For a while, I wasn't sure if Tess would ever settle down with someone. She had quite the chip on her shoulder after her father and I divorced. 
but she and Samuel appear to be content. Now, if only I could find someone. I knew the divorce was hard on Tess, and I wanted to make sure she knew I loved her, so I didn't date anyone after her dad and I split. Then, when she left town, I busied myself with getting my cupcake shop up and running. Now that it's moved into Kirsten's coffee shop, I find myself with more time, but no one to spend it with. And after the brain tumor scare a few months ago, I'm realizing how short life is, and that I don't want to go through the rest of it alone. But in this small town, good men are hard to come by, especially now that I'm in my 50s. With a sigh, I begin packing up the pastries. Some will keep for tomorrow, but most will have to be thrown out or given away. That's always the saddest part of my day, getting rid of the hard work that didn't sell. The bell above the door jingles, and I'm tempted to tell whoever it is that we're closed. Tess was supposed to have locked the door on her way out, and I've already shut down the till for the night. But when my gaze lands on the customer, the words die in my throat. He is gorgeous, a literal silver fox. His face is chiseled to perfection, a strong chin, a nose most models would kill for, and a perfect dimple that draws the right amount of attention to his lips. I'm sorry, I know you're closing, but I've got a bus full of hungry football players, and I was hoping I could take whatever you've got left off your hands. Even his voice is perfect, deep and rich like a fine, dark chocolate. And for a moment, I am mesmerized. Then I force myself to focus on his request. You want to buy everything I have left? Is that possible? It's not a request I have ever received before, but as I glance over the inventory, I realize it would be a nice commission, definitely worth reopening the till for. Besides, it will give me a few more minutes with the handsome stranger. It is possible. I do a quick count to see how many are left. There are about 40 pastries left, and at $3 a pastry, that will total $120. Sold. I'll take them all. Do you have enough boxes? Um, I think so. But honestly, I'm not sure. People who buy our pastries tend to eat them in the cafe. I can count on one hand the number of times I've had to box items up. Let me just check inventory. He nods and I head to the small storeroom. Most of the shelves hold the coffee supplies that Kirsten needs, but she did clear a shelf for me to store boxes and ingredients. Thankfully, the stack of boxes appears to be enough and I gather them up in return. So what football team, I ask, as I begin constructing the boxes and filling them with pastries. I love football, but I'm pretty sure this man does not coach in our town. I would have remembered him. The Parkland Pirates, just a half hour south of here. Are you a fan? Of football, yes, but our team here is rather small, so I generally just watch the pro teams. Eh, He waves his hand in a dismissive gesture. High school is so much better. It's real. Nobody getting paid millions of dollars to play. They just play because they love it. I believe you, I say with a laugh. Hey, you're closing shop, right? I glance up at him, wondering where this is going. Yes, I say slowly. Why don't you come with us? The words burst out of his mouth, and for a moment, he looks surprised at them. Then he composes himself with a smile and continues. We're playing the Tonoma Titans in an hour. You could come and watch from the sidelines. Oh, I don't know. A piece of me wants to say yes. After all, I never do crazy things like this. And I am enjoying talking with this man, even though I don't know his name. But... I don't know this man. He seems legit, but what if he's not? Besides, what would the players think? Come on, it will be fun, and I'll bring you back here after the game. Do you have anywhere else to be? I don't, and as I realize that if I say no, I will just be going home to an empty house again, I find myself nodding. Okay, if you're sure the rest of the team won't mind... 
mind? He chuckles and the dimples in his chin deepens. They love fans, and if these pastries are half as good as they look, they'll love you for life. Jameson. I have no idea what I'm doing as I extend the invitation, but it is out of my mouth before I can take it back. And then she accepts, and I am committed. It must be the stress of taking all these testosterone-filled high school boys on a bus alone. My assistant coach is coming straight from his wife's ultrasound appointment, that has caused me to lose my mind. I don't even know this woman's name, and I gave up dating a long time ago. All right, she says as she closes the last box. If you can help with these, we can probably take them in one trip. She has managed to get all the pastries into eight small white boxes. Of course. I'm Jameson, by the way. Jameson Douglas. I stick out my hand as if introductions are needed before I can lift a box. She must think I'm crazy. First, I come in at closing time. Then I wipe her stock out. And then I ask her to join me on a bus with a bunch of rowdy teenage boys before I even know her name. I have officially stepped off the deep end. Thankfully, she takes my hand and responds in kind. Tabitha, Tabitha King. I hold her hand a second longer than necessary. It's been a long time since I've had a woman's hand in mine, and hers is soft and silky. Lily, my ex-wife, filed for divorce the day after our youngest daughter graduated from high school. Said she'd stayed with me to not affect the kids, but that she was no longer in love with me and wanted to get her life back. I hadn't realized I was holding her back, but her leaving made me see what I had become an angry man who drank too much. The divorce sobered me up and set my trajectory on the right path again, but the shame of my failed marriage stayed with me. I didn't want to hurt another woman the way I had Lily, so even though I dated, I never let it get very serious. But I'd also never felt anything like I'm feeling with this woman in front of me. Okay, Tabitha, let's go. I drop her hand to pick up the boxes, though it's the last thing I want to do. I rather enjoyed holding her hand, and I wouldn't mind doing it again. She grabs the other four boxes and her jacket and follows me out of the cafe, stopping only long enough to turn the lights off and lock the door behind her. How she manages to get her keys out of her pocket and lock the door while holding the boxes is beyond me, and my interest in her grows. Who is this woman, really? A pretty woman who can bake and is willing to jump into an adventure with me? A woman like that is hard to find. The bus door swings open as we approach, and the driver, Carl, raises an eyebrow at the sight of Tabitha behind me. I shrug and shoot him a smile as I board the bus. I've got treats. There's enough for everyone to have one, so take one and pass the box back. Just one? A boy groans from the middle of the bus. We'll discuss seconds later, I say. And make sure to only pass back enough boxes for the 30 players. Who's she? Another asks as Tabitha steps up behind me. This is Tabitha King. She made all these delicious treats you are about to enjoy, and I've convinced her to come along for the ride and watch you play. Tabitha flashes a tiny wave and smile as she hands her four boxes to me. These I'm keeping up front. I want to be sure and get a pastry, and I'm sure Carl will as well. Have a seat, I say, gesturing to the empty one across from me before turning to Carl. Okay, let's get to the game. As the bus pulls away from the curb, I sit down and open a box. An enormous, cinnamon-laden bear claw stares up at me. Bear claws are my weakness, and I pluck it from the box without hesitation. Then I hold the box out to Tabitha, but she smiles and shakes her head. Carl, however, takes the chocolate muffin underneath, and then I return the box to the others. How long have you been baking? I ask Tabitha, before I take a bite of the bear claw. Oh, it seems like forever, I suppose, but I only opened the shop after my daughter graduated from high school. I needed something to get me out of my empty house. You live alone, then? I hadn't noticed a ring on her finger, but I'd met enough people who didn't wear one, 
either because of their jobs or some other less than wholesome reason, even when they were married, to never take that as a for sure bet. I do. My daughter is back in town now, but she has her own place. It's just been me for a long time. My heart aches at that, though I'm not sure why. I'm sorry. Don't be. My husband and I divorced a long time ago, and it was probably for the best. How about you? Are you married? The words sound casual, but I do not miss the coy side glance she gives me. Not anymore. My wife decided she didn't like marriage after our youngest graduated. That was eight years ago. I guess it happens, she says, and then the conversation stalls between us. Why did you invite me? She asks, at the same time I ask, what made you say yes? We both chuckle, and I motion for her to go first. Why did you invite me to join you? Truth? Look around. I'm surrounded by teenage boys except for Carl here. You said you liked football, and you looked like you could use a night out. So I took a chance. Why did you say yes? Because I did need a night out. My daughter started dating a wonderful man, and I'm happy for her, but I didn't feel like going home to an empty house. And I do like football. We shared another smile, and a warm sensation flooded my heart. Chapter 2. Tabitha The ride itself is nice as Jameson and I continue getting to know each other. But when we reach the stadium, my nerves begin to curl inward and bunch. What was I thinking? He's the coach. He'll be focused on the players and calling plays. And I'll be, what, sitting in the bleachers by myself? Standing beside the bench? I should have asked these questions before agreeing to get on a bus with a total stranger. This behavior is so unlike me. I'm usually the type to plan everything, to make sure I know every exit route and every possible turn. But after the brain tumor a few months ago, I found myself taking more chances, like this one. All right, boys, grab your gear and head into the locker room. I'll meet you inside shortly, Jameson shouts over the noise of teenage boys chatting and high-fiving each other. Surprisingly, though, they file off in an orderly fashion. Wow, they're really well behaved. It's been a while since I had a high school student, but I've had many come in the shop. And while most behave themselves, some decide it's the place to show off their obnoxious behavior. Seeing these boys is refreshing. He chuckles as he grabs a few bags of gear. Well, they know if they don't behave, then they don't get to play. I don't believe in rewarding poor behavior. Handsome, single, and he has manners? I feel like I've hit the trifecta in a dating lottery. Dating? I have lost my mind. This isn't a date, is it? Come on, I'll show you to our bench and you can hang out there until I return. Are you sure it's allowed? My nerves clench tighter, making my voice come out smaller than normal. I mean, I don't have any credentials or anything. Relax, he says, placing a hand on my arm. It's a high school football game, not a professional game. No one is going to be looking for your ID. Okay. I say the word, but my eyes are fixed on the place where our skin is touching. Tiny neurons are firing, sending sparks of electricity flying up my arm. How long has it been since a man's touch affected me like this? For that matter, how long has it been since I felt a man's touch? He clears his throat and removes his hand. And just like that, the heat is gone. We better get going, he says, and I follow him off the bus. True to his word, he bypasses the locker room and leads me to the covered bench where he and the players will sit during the game. The stands are already filling with people, but none of them seem to care about us. And why would they? Most of them are probably family or friends keeping their eyes peeled for their loved one. 
the folly of my decision crashes down on me again. I know no one on this team, and even after conversing with Jameson the whole way over, I barely know him. Make yourself comfortable, he says, bringing me back to reality. I'll be back as soon as I can. I watch him walk away and then take a deep breath and sit down on the bench. I can do this, I tell myself. It will be fun. Jameson. The boys are already suited up and ready when I enter the locker room, and I take a deep breath to clear Tabitha's face from my mind. I still am not sure why I invited her to come along. Maybe Al's ultrasound appointment made me nostalgic or something. But now I feel like I'm on a roller coaster. Every time I think about her, my heart speeds up and adrenaline courses through me. But then I remember that this is not a date. I remember that I'm at work and that I need to keep my head in the game. And the adrenaline fades only to be replaced with confusion. I never even asked my ex-wife to come to games with me. Of course, some of that had to do with the fact that she hated football. But still, why would I invite this woman I don't even know? I must be lonelier than I thought I was. There's no time to think about that now, though. I need to get these boys pumped up and ready to win. Okay, now we know the Titans are a good team, but we can beat them. We're going to focus on runs to the outside as much as we can and pass when we have to. Though my receivers are decent at catching, my quarterback is not the strongest at throwing. He has a good arm, but his aim isn't always the best. He throws almost as many interceptions as he does receptions. So I try to keep his passing to a minimum. Even then, I cross my fingers and hope for the best every time he launches the ball. Same starting lineup as usual. Let's play as if it's our last game. Pirates on three. The boys place their hands on mine, and on the count of three, all of them yell pirates as loud as they can. Now the real challenge for me begins, keeping my head in the game while trying not to be distracted by Tabitha. She still sits on the bench where I left her when I approach. As if she knows I have to keep my focus, she merely smiles and waves. This woman really is amazing. We win the coin toss and start out with the ball. Every once in a while, I can hear Tabitha clapping or calling out behind me, and I smile. She should come more often, coach. I turn to look at Cooper, my running back. He is nodding at Tabitha behind me. You think so? Yeah, I mean, we're winning for one thing, so I think she's good luck. Plus, you seem happier. I do? I hadn't thought I was unhappy, but if my players are picking up on something, perhaps I need to look again. Cooper shrugs. Not that you seem sad or angry or anything usually. You just seem happier tonight. Thanks, Cooper. If we win, maybe I'll ask her if she'll keep coming. You go, coach, he says as he raises his hand to fist bump me. I chuckle but return the gesture before turning back to the action on the field. Hey, Jameson, sorry I'm late, Al, my assistant coach says, appearing at my side. Who's the woman? A baker we met on the way who might just be a good luck charm. His face wrinkles in confusion, but he says nothing more as he dons his gear and takes his place beside me. As the game continues and the team pulls farther ahead, I begin to wonder if perhaps Tabitha is a good luck charm, both for the team and for me. Chapter 3. Tabitha Why do you look so happy? Tess asks me as we refill the glass case the next morning. What do you mean? I ask, but I know the smile on my face is betraying me. After the game last night, Jameson dropped off the boys and then drove me home. We talked the whole way, and he said he would drop in today to take me to lunch. That's what I mean, she says, pointing at my face. You're grinning like a loon. I met someone last night, a man. What? How? As I tell her the story, I watch her expression change from joy 
to concern, and finally to a mixture of both. Mom, I'm glad you've met someone, but what were you thinking jumping on a bus with him? I don't know. I just felt this connection to him, so I said yes. He's coming to take me to lunch today. You can meet him if you'd like. Of course I want to meet him. Meet who? Kirsten asks as she appears from the storeroom, Molly right behind her. Mom's new boyfriend. She met him last night. Ooh, do tell, Molly says as she fires up the coffee machines. I smile as I tell the story once again. I enjoy working with these girls, even though they are all younger than me. Their excitement is contagious and makes me feel young again. He sounds amazing, Kirsten says. I can't wait to check him out. The conversation shifts then, but I don't mind because it gives me time to replay the previous night in my mind. Before I know it, the morning rushes over and the lull right before lunchtime hits. At 11 on the dot, the door opens and Jameson steps inside. He looks relaxed in his jeans and flannel shirt, but just as handsome as he did yesterday, and he holds a single white rose in his hand. Tabitha, you are looking lovely today, he says, holding out the rose. A soft heat crawls up my neck as I take it. Thank you, Jameson. You are looking dapper yourself. So, this is Jameson, Tess says, coming up beside me. Pleased to meet you. I'm Tess, her daughter. Tess stresses the last two words, filling them with hidden meaning which Jameson appears to catch if his smile is any indication. Pleasure to meet you as well, Tess. Your mother is an amazing woman. Yes, she is. Where are you taking her? To lunch. I'm not from here, so do you have a recommendation? Actually, I would recommend the Italian restaurant right next door. The men who run it, Tristan and Dylan, are amazing cooks. She flashes a smile at Kirsten and Molly. All right. Jameson says with a smile. Italian it is. Jameson. We enter the restaurant and find a seat. The hostess, obviously recognizing Tabitha, leads us to a table near the back. This place is nice, I say as we sit down. The inside is a soft beige color accented with deep purple and greens that remind me of grapes and vineyards. It is. Tristan and Dylan worked hard on it, they just opened a few months ago, but the place is going strong. What's it like living in such a small town? The city where I live isn't huge, but it's big enough that I don't know my neighbors or the people who run the restaurants or coffee shops. Her lips form a sweet smile. It's nice. I love knowing the people. Tess went to school with Kirsten, who runs the coffee part of the cafe next door and her boyfriend is Kirsten's brother, so I've known them for ages. Tristan and Dylan are new to town, but they quickly adapted. Relationships are a little more challenging to start here because of the limited availability, but once they begin, they tend to last because people really get to know each other. Plus, we have great festivals around the holidays. In fact, our Halloween Spookathon is this weekend. You should come. Maybe I'll do that. I've always loved Halloween and dressing up. I used to dress up every year with my kids. She shakes her head and laughs. I used to as well. And then when my husband left, it became Tessa's and my favorite time. We would dress up as twins and attend the carnival every year. As I listen to her speak, something shifts inside me. I hadn't been looking for a relationship when I landed in her shop yesterday. In fact, I'd thought I was completely happy alone. But it is becoming clear to me that I am attracted to Tabitha and want to see where this goes. Tabitha, I'm really glad I met you. I didn't think my life was missing anything, but it is clear to me now that it was. I'm glad I met you too, she says. And then our conversation is interrupted by the waiter approaching the table. 
Chapter 4 Tabitha. I run my hand down my dress as I critique myself in the mirror. I'm not as thin as I used to be, but the dress shows off my attributes, and the corset hides the flaws I want it to. The long black wig makes my skin appear paler than normal, but that is the idea, as my costume is Morticia Adams. The doorbell rings, and with a wide smile, I open it to see Jameson dressed as Gomez on the other side. You look amazing, he says, as his eyes travel my body. It's not a leering gaze, but I feel my face flame nonetheless. Thank you. You do too. You ready for some small town magic? Absolutely. I take his arm, shutting the door behind me, and we make our way to the town hall, where the main part of the carnival will take place. The large room is decorated in black and silver with webs and bats hanging from the ceiling. This is amazing, he says as he takes in the decorations. They do something like this for every holiday? Well, the big ones, I say. Thanksgiving, Christmas, Fourth of July. Easter. What fun! As we make our way to the back table where a plethora of food has been laid out, a voice calls out Jameson Douglas, is that you? Jameson pales visibly as he turns to the blonde woman, making her way our direction. Lily, so nice to see you again, he says when she stops before us. I wish I could say the same, but I can't. What are you doing here? Pure hatred oozes from this woman's eyes, and I wonder who she is and what Jameson did to her. I'm here with Tabitha. She invited me. Her eyes flick to me, and a look of pity combines with her hatred. Hi, I'm Tabitha, and you are. I stick out my hand. Not knowing what else to do, but wanting to ease the tension that surrounds us. She glances down at my hand, but doesn't take it, and I lower my hand to my side, feeling like a fool. You should know he's a mean drunk, she says, and then she whirls away. I turn to Jameson, but I can't even form the questions racing through my head. Lily is my ex wife, he says with a sigh. And she's right. I was a mean drunk, but I haven't had a drink in 15 years. Losing her made me realize what I'd become, and I didn't like myself, so I decided to change. I want to believe him. I do. But my ex husband was also a mean drunk. Flashbacks from the times I cowered in the corner trying to avoid his fists flood my mind, and I have to get away. I'm sorry. I say, as I step away from him and hurry toward the exit. I haven't had a panic attack in years, not since my ex left, but I can feel one coming on now. How could I have been so stupid? Do I emit something that attracts drunks? I know that isn't fair, as I have never seen Jameson drunk, and he told me he no longer drinks, but I can't keep the feelings from bubbling up. I lean against the lamppost and try to slow my breathing. Jameson. What happened? Tess asks, appearing at my side. I don't want to tell her the truth, don't want her looking at me the way her mother did, but I pride myself on being truthful. My ex wife is here and just confronted us. She wanted to warn your mother about my drinking habit. Tessa's eyes widen and her mouth falls open. You drink? Not anymore, but I did when Lily and I were together. I'm gathering from your mother's reaction that she's had a bad experience with someone who drank. I look toward the door, but there is no sign of Tabitha. I wonder if she will even come back in. Yeah, my father. They divorced over it, and I'm not sure she's really trusted men since. I sigh in frustration. It's my worst nightmare come true. I finally meet a woman I want to see, and she's been traumatized by someone like who I used to be. 
Can I do anything to convince her I'm no longer that man? I haven't had a drink in 15 years. Her eyes scour my face. She is clearly trying to discern if I am lying or not, but I have nothing to hide. The day I gave the bottle up, I decided I would have no more secrets. I'm not open about my past, but I don't try to hide it either. I own up to it when people ask. I don't know. Let me go and talk to her. She places a hand on my arm. For what it's worth, I believe you, and I know how hard it is to make a new start. I wonder what she means as I watch her head toward the exit, but even more, I wonder if she will be able to convince Tabitha to hear me out. It's only been a week, but suddenly the thought of losing her weighs heavily on me. Chapter 5 Tabitha Mom, are you okay? I glance up at the sound of Tessa's voice and see her making her way toward me. Her long, dark hair is tied up like Princess Jasmine's, and she shivers as the cool air bites through her flowy costume. I'm fine, Tess. I just needed some air. She crosses her arms and fixes me with her pointed gaze. I talked to Jameson, Mom. You ran out on him. I couldn't help it. When I heard that he was a mean drunk, I had flashbacks of your father all over again. How can I see a man who I know has those tendencies? I really do think he's changed, Mom. I saw it in his eyes. Or he's a really good actor. Tess sighs and grabs my hands. Mom, I know his past scares you, but consider the source, too. If Dad had stopped drinking and sobered up, you'd still hate him for what happened. Perhaps his ex-wife is the same. Maybe she doesn't know he's changed, or if she does, maybe she can't accept it. I know how hard it is to change people's minds when they've formed an opinion of you. I smile at Tess. For a time, she had been a mean girl, one I wasn't proud of. But after meeting Samuel and dealing with my brain tumor scare, she has returned once again to the sweet girl I raised. But I do know it took a while for Kirsten to fully embrace her again. And even then, it probably had more to do with Samuel's influence than Tess herself. You're right. I should at least hear his side of the story before I make any decisions. That's the spirit. Besides, Mom, I really do think he's one of the good ones. And I'd love to know you have someone there with you. Why? Is there something you're not telling me? I glance to her left hand, but there is no ring on her finger. Not yet. But I have the feeling Samuel will propose before too much longer, and I want to know you won't be in your house all alone every night when he does. Okay, okay, I say with a shake of my head. I'll come back inside and see where it goes from there, but I better be the first one to see that ring when Samuel does propose. I promise, Mom. Jameson My heart speeds up as I see Tabitha returning with Tess. I'll have to thank her later. I have no idea what she said to her mother, but I'm glad to have the chance to tell her my side of the story. I'm sorry I ran out on you, Tabitha says when she reaches my side. I'm sure Tess told you about my ex. I nod. She did. And I'm so sorry, Tabitha, but that is not who I am anymore. When I lost Lily, I gave up drinking and decided I no longer wanted to be that man. I haven't opened myself up to any woman since then because I don't want to hurt anyone the way I hurt Lily. But I also don't want to lose you, Tabitha. I haven't felt like this in years. Please, give me a chance. Whether it's my words or my pleading smile, she agrees and places her hand in mine. Who's ready for a hayride? A voice calls from the front, and a cheer resonates through the room. I hope they have a lot of trucks, I whisper in Tabitha's ear as I squeeze her hand. There seems to be quite a few people here. Don't worry, they have several. We file out of the town hall with the rest of the group, and though I keep my eyes peeled for Lily, 
I am pleased to not see her in the throng. She must have left, and since Tabitha didn't know her, I assume she doesn't live in this town. A small part of me wonders what she was doing here then, or who she might have been with, but I dismiss the thought. She is no longer a part of my life, and I have a beautiful woman at my side who deserves all of my attention. We end up in a wagon with Tess and Samuel, and their friends Kirsten, Tristan, Dylan, and Molly. As the truck moves forward, I grab one of the blankets and wrap it around Tabitha, pulling her closer to me in the process. She smiles before laying her head on my shoulder. The truck pulls us slowly through the town, and as I watch the buildings pass by, I wonder if I could move here. It does seem to have a peaceful, relaxed feel that my city doesn't, and though it would make my commute longer, it would be nice to be closer to Tabitha if our relationship continues. What are you thinking about? She asks, looking up at me. The future, I say, and how I very much hope you are in it. As she smiles, I know this is my cue, and I lean in and place my lips on hers. It's still early, but somehow I know that Tabitha and I will end up together. The Epilogue Ten Months Later Tabitha You look beautiful, I say to Tess as she adjusts her veil in the mirror. Her hand touches the lace one more time. Do you really think so? I'm not sure about this veil anymore. No, it's perfect. You are just suffering from nerves, but you don't need to. Samuel is an amazing person, and I know the two of you will be so happy. Samuel proposed to Tess last Christmas, and they decided to have a late summer wedding. I think they might have waited to have a Christmas one, but Tess wanted to have Molly as a bridesmaid, and she was now nine months pregnant with her first child. She and Dylan had married just before Thanksgiving last year, and Kirsten and Tristan had married earlier this year. It certainly was a year for weddings. Is that normal? Tessa's eyes are wide and filled with fear. It's absolutely normal, I say. I'd be a little worried about you if you weren't a little nervous. Marriage is a big change, but a great one. All right. She takes a deep breath and sighs. You're right. The door to the dressing room opens and Kirsten's dark head pops in. Are you ready? Everything is set up. We're just waiting on you. Where's Molly? Tess asks. She made it, didn't she? Don't worry. Molly is sitting in the back row. She can't stand as long as she used to, so she's saving energy to make it through the wedding. Okay, I guess I'm ready then. Tess gives herself one last look in the mirror and then grabs her bouquet. I'm so proud of you, Tess, I say, pulling her in for a hug before following her out the door. The beach area they have chosen to get married at is set up beautifully. White chairs straddle a red carpet that leads up to a lovely gazebo. Toll and twinkly lights hang from columns around the perimeter, and a violinist plays softly. Molly and Samuel's two closest friends, Jim and Trevor, join us at the back, and I scan the chairs for Jameson. He catches my eye and flashes a wave. Are you ready? Tristan asks as he touches my arm. Tristan and Dylan are serving as ushers, and as it appears everyone is ready, it's time for him to seat me. The last guest. I take his arm and allow him to lead me up the aisle and to the vacant chair next to Jameson. You look beautiful, Jameson whispers as I sit, and I take his hand. Tristan sits on the other side of me, and then the music shifts. Molly and Jim walk up the aisle first. Though very pregnant, Molly shines in her soft pink dress. She smiles at Dylan as she passes him and joins the pastor and Samuel up front. Kirsten and Trevor come next, and I smile at how close the girls have become. Once bitter enemies, time, love, and working together has healed those wounds, and now the two are closer than ever. 
Once Kirsten and Trevor reach the front, the music changes again, and the wedding march begins. I stand and watch my beautiful daughter walk up the aisle. Since her father is no longer in the picture, she decided she wanted to walk down the aisle alone. My heart aches slightly that she has no one to give her away, but that had been Tessa's decision. As she takes her place next to Samuel, memories of my own wedding so long ago fill my mind. Though my marriage wasn't a happy one, my wedding day was, and I know Tessa's day will also be special. I just hope her marriage will be too. You've done a great job with her, Jameson says as we sit back down. He didn't know Tess and her mean girl years, but he's heard stories. I've tried. I smile up at him before turning my attention back to the wedding at hand. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today. The pastor continues speaking, but my focus is on Tess and Samuel. Love shines from both of their eyes, and I wonder if they are even aware of what is happening around them. Before I know it, the pastor is pronouncing them man and wife, and they are kissing. I wipe a stray tear from my cheek and join in the applause as they run back down the aisle. I can't believe my baby is married. Do you think you'll ever want to marry again? Jameson asks as he leads me out of the row and down the aisle. Had anyone asked me that a year ago, my answer would have been no. But since he's come into my life, I can see it. Maybe, I say coyly, if the right man asked me. He opens his mouth as if he is going to do just that when a commotion in front of us grabs his attention. I turn to see Molly on her knees in the sand holding her stomach. Dylan reaches her seconds before we do. Are you okay? He asks. Yeah, I think so. It's just, oh, she grabs her stomach again. I think my water just broke. Now? Panic fills his voice as he looks around. We need a car. Who has a car? We have a car, Molly says through gritted teeth. Oh, right, we do. Dylan begins patting his pocket, but Tristan places a hand on his shoulder. I'll drive, and we can take my car. Dylan nods. Right, thank you. Isn't Samuel her doctor? I ask. I don't want to cut Tessa's day short, but Samuel is the only doctor in town. No, you can't tell Samuel, Molly says. I don't want to ruin his wedding day. Too late, Kirsten says. Here he comes. Hey, Molly, I hear you might be having a baby, Samuel says with a smile. No, I'm sure it can wait. I don't want to ruin your day. Nonsense, Tess says. A baby is a happy occurrence. What better way to end a wedding than with the birth of a new life? You're not mad, Molly asks. No, silly. I'm excited. Let's get you to the clinic and get this baby delivered. Then Samuel and I can take our honeymoon, and when we get back, we can have a big party to celebrate our wedding and this little one. Another tear escapes my eye at Tessa's thoughtfulness. She has changed and grown so much that I almost can't believe she's the same girl. Okay, let's move this party to the clinic, Tristan calls out, as he helps Dylan lift Molly to her feet. Jameson I touch the box in my pocket as I wait next to Tabitha at the hospital. I had planned to propose at the end of the reception, but Molly's premature labor has shifted my plans. Should I ask her here or wait for a more romantic place? It's a boy, Dylan calls as he pops out of the delivery room. Samuel says he and the nurse need a few more minutes to assess her and the baby, and then you can all come in and see him. Cheers and clapping erupt in the crowded waiting room, and I use the moment to pull Tabitha aside. This isn't the way I planned it, but I don't want to wait any longer, I say, ignoring her quizzical expression. I drop to my knees and open the box. Tabitha King, will you marry me? Shock covers her face for a moment, but then she smiles. 
Yes, of course I will marry you, Jameson. I slip the ring on her finger and pull her in for a kiss. As we part, another cheer goes up and I turn to see the group focused on us. Tess runs over to embrace her mother. Mom, I'm so happy for you. This is the best day ever. I'm sorry this isn't the day you planned, Tabitha says, returning the hug. No one could plan this. Tess laughs as her smile widens. But I'm pretty sure this is better than I ever could have planned. As long as everyone is sharing good news, Kirsten says, stepping forward, Tristan and I have some of our own. We're pregnant, too. More hugs and clapping ensue, and Samuel has to shout to be heard over the noise. I'm not sure what just happened out here, but Molly and the baby can take visitors. No more than four at a time, though, please. The crowd quiets as those closest to Molly and Dylan shuffle toward the door to see the baby and give their congratulations. Samuel weaves his way through the people until he reaches Tess's side. I need to stay for monitoring until Dr. Smith gets here, but she's on her way, and then we can head out. I'm in no hurry, Tess says, smiling up at him. Everyone I love is here celebrating, and I can't think of anywhere I'd rather be. Me either, I whisper in Tabitha's ear before kissing her again. She smiles at me when we part, and as I look around at the people I've come to know, I realize that this is the place where I want to spend the rest of my life, here in this small town surrounded by good friends. The End If you enjoyed this story, please leave a review. Just a few words really helps.